Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, our subject this evening is still definitions, only it is not so much the theory of definitions as definitions in practice. And our essential assignment is to take up the homework of 28, I think it is 28 definitions that was assigned uh, last week. I'd like to do this by the volunteer method that we have employed in connection with other exercises because I believe that gives you an insight into different kinds of approaches and problems that are raised in connection with the topic. So we'll just follow the normal procedure and if at the end of any given volunteer statement, and I'll try to make a conscientious effort to repeat everything that is said so everyone can hear it. If at the end you feel that some key point has been omitted or some further fallacy you'd like to comment on, please raise your hand and I'll recognize you until I reach the point in connection with any given one that I think its value is exhausted, in which case I will simply remain blind to any hands and plunge on to keep a certain pace. Now, I'd like to establish a few ground rules at the outset. We are here concerned with these definitions for purposes of illustrating and grasping more clearly the rules of logic, not the facts of the particular subject matter. Now, of course, you cannot criticize or formulate definitions devoid of a knowledge of the factual material encompassed by the field that the definition is relevant to. And therefore, very often, questions of sheer fact will arise that would take a good deal of time to investigate and establish a viewpoint on one way or the other. I want to bypass that entirely this evening uh, because it's very time consuming and it's not central or germane to our specific purposes. Whenever such questions arise, if they do this evening, I simply will say, here is a question of fact. If the answer came out such and such, the definition would then have to be uh, developed in this direction. If the answer came out differently to the question of fact, it would affect the definition in such and such a way without here trying to decide all of the many questions of fact involved. Now, an equivalent point, or another preliminary point, we are not attempting to give true positive definitions of all of these 28 terms. That would take hours and hours to do, unless we just read them off, but if we tried to validate the definitions and explain the justification of each clause in them, uh, it would take hours to do this many definitions, and it would be impossible, therefore, to do in the time we have available. What we want to do, therefore, with uh, all of them, except for the big five, uh, is just identify in common sense terms what are the fallacy or fallacies that they commit, and then at the end, in a very generalized way, what overall direction would you have to take to go about producing a correct definition of this term? But we will not attempt to give a literal, precise definition of all of these terms. Now, for the big five, when we get to them, what I'd like to do is take two or three definitions that hopefully someone will volunteer, two or three different people each time will volunteer, we can all copy them down, assuming they're not paragraphs long. If they're paragraphs long, they violate the rule of obscurity anyway, so they would be out on that ground. And then I want to, for each of these, go over with you in some detail the steps for each of the five uh, that I myself went through to arrive at a definition, what considerations I took into account, what blind alleys I was led up to sort of let you in on the detailed mental steps I went through, because I believe that in indicating the kinds of problems you come up with in these uh, five, just as examples, you'll get a broader understanding of some theoretical points of wider interest uh, that will be applicable uh, to the general theory of definition and will supplement our treatment of it uh, last time. But these points I will introduce only in conjunction with the individual definitions that we take up. So let's go at, at first in order, and then we'll see how slow or fast we're going uh, as we get started. And let us plunge in. This is now on page 8, the exercise on definitions number 1. An editorial is an expression of opinion in a newspaper. Anybody have any criticisms of that? I have on the front row a gentleman, yes. <laughs> 
narrow. Now, let me uh, try to repeat what you say as you say it so people will hear. You say it's too narrow. I agree. Why is it too narrow? Well, this isn't restricted just to newspapers. You say it is not restricted just to newspapers. There can be editorials in what other type of thing beside newspapers? In television, in radio, in magazines. So if you wanted a general indication of what uh, sort of thing an editorial can appear in, it would be some form of communications medium, right, that would run all the way from newspapers through television, and therefore it's certainly too narrow. Did anybody have any other objection to this? Yes, the gentleman on the right. Well, the fallacy of equivalence, first of all, equivalence is the name of the rule. The fallacies under that are either it's too wide or too narrow. He's already said it's too narrow, so if you have another aspect, presumably you think it's too wide? Uh, in other words, you say it includes things that are not editorials, and therefore it is too wide. And you gave as a good example a letter to the editor, which is certainly not an editorial, but it is an expression of opinion which appears in a newspaper. Did anybody have any other examples of uh, an expression of opinion that appears in a newspaper that is not an editorial beyond letters to the editor that would also simply be further illustrations of the fact that this is too wide. Yes. Dear Abby. Dear Abby, all right, that would be in letters also, or it would be signed columns, put it that way. Individual columnists signing their pieces uh, are not letters of, uh, are not expressions of opinion, are not editorials. Or again, suppose there's a hard news story, and in the middle of it, suppose it's on the recent British election, uh, and in the middle of the factual information about the data on the election, the reporter has a paragraph to the effect that he thinks that Heath is rotten and lousy, and then he goes on and back to give you the uh, election results. Well, that is certainly an expression of opinion in a newspaper, but that is not an editorial. Now, you could say he is editorializing, but that is obviously a derivative usage. That phrase is, is an injection of subjective estimate in, in an otherwise what is a hard news story. Well, then, if we ask what would be required, if we want to distinguish an editorial on the one hand from a hard news story or a signed column or a letter to the editor, we want to distinguish it from all those, what is essential then to being an editorial. In other words, what direction would we have to take? And here I'm going to say, I'm not asking you for a formal legalistic definition, but just an indication of the direction that would distinguish an editorial from these other forms. Yes? You say you'd have to indicate whose opinion it is. And of course, the essential thing there is that it represents, in some sense, the opinion of the people who run the uh, outlet, whether it's the editors, the publishers, the managers, the owners uh, of the outlet. It's a formal statement of the medium's position as such, as against an individually signed uh, column or individually endorsed oral statement. And so this uh, uh, um, uh, definition in some is too wide and too narrow. Now once you know that, then you know it's off the track altogether, and it becomes redundant to say on top of that it's not fundamental. So there's no use adding that as a further objection to it, because it obviously can't be fundamental if it isn't even equivalent. Uh, I don't think that there's anything else essentially wrong uh, with this one. Did anyone have any other objections? There's no uh, circularity here. There's nothing negative, and it's perfectly clear as far as it goes, and it has a genus and differentia of a sort, even if it's not a good genus and differentia. Anything further on that? All right, number two, science. Is any information acquired by the use of mathematical and or experimental methods? Now, this is the actual operating definition of a great number of people. Uh, I've, I've seen it put this baldly, but uh, there are a great many people who would hesitate if it was formulated this way, but who actually hold this as a definition of science. Now, I think there are grave problems and objections and fallacies in this definition. Who wants to start anywhere uh, with a criticism of this? I'll try and take different hands so far as I can see them, but if you're at the back, I cannot see that far. Uh, 
So you have to move your hand back and forth. I can see motion, but I can't see something stationary at that distance. Yes? Too wide and too narrow. All right, start off with it being too wide then. You say any information. I certainly agree there's something much too wide about that. What's wrong with that? Why is that too wide? You say you have to be concerned with the type of information. Well, they try to specify it. They say it's any information acquired by specific methods, mathematical or experimental methods. So it's not as though he simply says science is any information. So you'd have to be a little more specific to tell me why is any information uh, not enough. The mathematical experimental uh, terms are too narrow. Well, you say the, uh, let's first take, though, the too wide before you get on to the too narrow. Is there information you can acquire by mathematical and or experimental methods that is not as such science? Because if so, then this is too wide. It takes in too much territory. Could anyone give an example? I think I see a hand back there. Yes. Two plus two equals four. Well, you say that's a piece of information. Well, a person could argue, uh, isn't that a part of science, namely a part of arithmetic. Although if all you knew was 2 plus 2 equals 4, you could argue that that is simply a preliminary toward science. But you could give even more examples. If you add up the entries on your credit card, uh, your bill, and you get a total, well, you have got a piece of information acquired by mathematical methods, but that is not per se a part of science. You can say that is an application of a particular science or branch of science, namely addition, but as such, the total of your car on your credit card is information acquired by a mathematical method. That's not science. And the same exact thing is true of experiment. You know, the case I think of here is that Hugo had a play called Le Roi Samuse, The King Amuses Himself. It was brought out in an edition under the title The King Amuses Himself, and it sold, I think, I can't remember the figures, but something like 8,000 copies. And the next year it was brought out under the title The Lustful King Amuses Himself. Everything else remaining the same, and it sold, I think, 38,000 copies. <laughs> now, in its own crude way, that is an experiment in which factors are held common, and there's only one change, and there was a corresponding change in the effect. And you had, you could say, acquired some information by that particular experiment, presumably that a reference to sex will... Uh, have some effect on the sales of a book, but that is not as such a part of science. It might be a lead to something that could become science, but it is not as in that form. Well, what conclusion do you draw from this then? If we were going to correct this, first of all, from the aspect that it's too wide, well, I would say that you'd have to draw the conclusion science is not simply a miscellany of items of information but it involves some organized or systematized knowledge of some area in terms of general principles, formulated in terms of general laws or general principles, as against random bits of information or observations by whatever methods they were acquired. Now, random bits of data might be material for the later development of science, but it's because science involves an organized, systematized, approach to a field in terms of general laws that you, uh, we say, for instance, that science began with the Greeks, although there was all sorts of individual discrete pieces of data, much of it acquired mathematically or experimentally prior to the Greeks, but properly speaking, that is not science. So this is therefore definitely too wide. Now, from what aspect is this? Well, somebody over there said it's also too narrow, which I agree with. From what aspect is this too narrow? I see a hand at the very back, I think. <laughs> well, but th you say it still it seems too wide because it doesn't include accounting, but accounting in that sense would be an application of mathematical methods to a particular field. So you could call that an applied science. Uh, so I don't think that would be an objection. And in any event, I don't want to hear try to formulate but a positive definition, but indicate a direction and specifically focus on the fallacies. Now, looking at it from the point of view of it being too narrow, uh, 
who thinks that this is too narrow a definition. In other words, it excludes things which are a science. Yes, the lady. Well, you say a science is a field of study, not just isolated information. I believe that's a point that I tried to indicate earlier. I'm thinking up here a somewhat different point. Is there things that could qualify perfectly well as science which do not come under this definition even though they're information? Because they do not employ mathematical or experimental methods. If there are, then of course this is too narrow and the definition is invalidated. Yes, sir. Can you give me an example of something that is a science that does not use mathematical or experimental methods and that therefore wipes out this definition? We may as well take the bull by the horns and plunge right in to the definition. Yes. Well, he says, what about epistemology? What about any branch of uh, philosophy, which is surely a science, but it does not acquire neither in me metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics, or aesthetics do you acquire the substance of the information by mathematical methods or by experimental methods. Now, don't confuse observation with experimentation. We'll be discussing experimentation next week. Experimentation is a specific manipulation of variables where you hold things constant and see what happens when you alter one variable. But, uh, uh, so it's not the same as observation, but philosophy in all of its branches is surely a science it's based on observation and reasoning, but it does not use the specific methods of mathematics or experimentation. And, of course, you could multiply those examples. History, I would certainly regard as a science, and it doesn't use either of those methods. I don't believe economics requires either of those methods, even mathematics, but that is at least a debatable question. I certainly don't believe that mathematics has any role in psychology, and I have grave doubts whether experimentation has any role in psychology, but that is at least open to question and we don't have to decide that here. What is essentially wrong with this definition is that it takes one science, the science which has the greatest prestige, namely physics, and erects that into a model for all uh, science. And therefore, it's, that's the, the fundamental error. It is true that physics began to develop when they combined mathematics with the experimental method. But, of course, that is because of the particular subject matter of physics. If you try to take physics as the archetype and say that everything has to be modeled on physics, you get into precisely the disasters that they're in today, where uh, psychologists are busy running around collecting all kinds of incredibly useless but scrupulously mathematicized uh, material from completely pointless but laboriously carried out experiments in order to prove that they are really uh, scientists. And where economists go into the most incredible constructions from the higher calculus and differential equations in order to justify conclusions which simply cannot be justified, but they check it all up with mathematics to give it the veneer uh, of science. On the other hand, people will say, using this same definition, there's no such thing as a scientific ethics. Uh, because ethics, uh, you can't apply mathematics uh, and so on to. You can't say three units of courage minus two units of uh, cowardice equals a net plus one of bravery and therefore a virtue. And since you can't do that, mathematics is just mystical and one is as good as the other. Those are some of the disasters that come from having a definition uh, like this. As a general direction, I would say that you'd have to include in science two points that it is, just to recapitulate, that it is organized, systematized information in a, in a given field in terms of laws, that's one, and second, a reference to the method acquired by the method of reason on the basis of observation. And then, of course, you would see that uh, mathematical or experimental methods are simply uh, one possible way of implementing the general method, the scientific method of reason. All right, I think we can. We have to keep a certain pace if we're to hit all 28 tonight. Number three, independence is the characteristic of not needing other people. Now here, presumably, genus, the genus is characteristic, and the differentia is of not needing other people. 
Now, and again, presumably this is meant to apply to human beings in this usage, so let's take it as a human characteristic. Who had any objections to this one? The lady on the aisle at the back. It violates the rule of negatives. It surely does. And for the obvious reason that it does not tell you something positive. It tells you that an independent person does not need other people. It doesn't tell you what he is positively. Is there any other rule that it violates beyond being negative? That is the obvious central fallacy here. Is there any other rule that anybody saw? Yes. You say it's too wide. Why is it too wide? Because it just states that it's a characteristic, doesn't say what kind of characteristic. You would want to specify human characteristic? Or that it's a virtue. Well, now wait. You want to make it a virtue as its genus. And that wouldn't really be fair because if you are defining uh, independence, uh, we want to be able to define it in a straightforward, factual way. And then when you get to ethics, raise the question, is this a proper characteristic or not? You will prejudge the question unfairly if you stick your ethical theory right into the definition. If you say this is the virtue which consists of so-and-so, you can no longer ask the question, well, is independence a virtue? Because you've made it true by definition. Now, it's only a certain approach to ethics which would validate that this is a virtue. And therefore, at the outset, we simply don't, we, we, we leave it neutral. Now, of course, we don't say the antisocial vice, which consists of so and so, is simply, I think, characteristic is fair enough. But I do think that this is too wide, not from the point of view of the genus, but the definition taken as a whole. I can think of things which do not need other people. Uh, the obvious example being a corpse, uh, which is you would not obviously call independent. Uh, can you possibly argue that this is too narrow in addition? Can you have an independent person who in some sense does need other people, in some sense? And therefore you could say this was also too narrow. In what sense could you argue that there can be a completely independent person who nevertheless needs other people? In what sense might that be argued? Yes, sir. If you have a division of labor society, and you are not living on a self-sustaining farm or a desert island where you look after yourself entirely, then you do, in that sense, need other people to trade the product of your effort for theirs. But of course, then what would make you independent in such a case? Not the fact that you, quote, uh, don't need them, but the fact that you pay for what you get. You, you produce the material equivalent, and therefore you earn what you get, by means of your own effort. So it's simply an indirect form of uh, sustaining yourself by your own effort. And there can be many things you need from other people, even including love, assuming you rationally define the nature of that need. So this definition is also too narrow uh, from the aspect that it is too vague and simply carte blanche saying an independent person does not need others and implying, therefore, that any uh, division of labor society obliterates the possibility of independence, uh, which, of course, is uh, uh, disastrous uh, politically because uh, the first thing that will happen is that someone will then say, well, if this is what independence is, then nobody can be independent in society. We are all, to use that glorious modern expression, interdependent, a uh, completely senseless concept, and uh, therefore, since everybody depends on everybody, everybody should serve everybody, and you reinstitute altruism and uh, everything that it implies simply by starting with the definition of this kind. And on the other hand, if you accept this kind of definition, and then you find you do need other people in some sense, you begin to reproach yourself if you accept independence as a virtue uh, and suffer uh, various doubts uh, on no grounds, no justification, whatever. All right, now, how would you approximately reformulate this so that it is positive and will state what is independence and it will allow for uh, uh, the appropriate relationship between people when they trade uh, uh, values? Does anybody have an indication of a direction? That's all we're asking again, not for a formal... Um, yes? Yes? 
Well, you say having the ability to function freely. Uh, I think that that would erase more questions than it would answer because you would immediately have to give a definition of what functioning freely consists of if you define independence in terms of freedom. And uh, that in itself raises a great many questions. And I, I think that you can define independence more simply without uh, de de uh, approaching it via the concept of freedom. Uh, again, I'm not asking you for a formal definition, but an indication of a direction, that's all. Yes? You say the characteristic of acting on your own judgment. That's the general idea, relying on your own mind, your own efforts, your own actions for the values that you seek, and understanding that in such a way that that includes the possibility of trading the product of your actions for that of others. And if you, in, in other words, you define it in terms of self-reliant uh, judgment and action, that would include intellectual independence, financial independence as against parasitism, uh, etc. All right, let us step on to number four. Hypochondria, a condition where a person worries a great deal about his health. Condition where a person worries a great deal about his health. I'm trying to take different people if I can remember who I took. Yes. Hypochondria is to wear. You object to wear. All right, I agree with that. But here, of course, they say condition wear uh, uh, as the genus. So they treat, he does try to give it a genus, namely condition, but what is the trouble with that genus, the genus condition? Hypochondria is a mental disorder. Absolutely right. Hypochondria is a mental disorder, a mental ailment, a neurosis, something of that sort. A condition is much too broad uh, a genus uh, for a thing like this and does not therefore perform the function of a genus. The function of a genus is to integrate this concept with all the allied ones so that you can carry over all the knowledge you have of those allied concepts to your discussion of this particular one. Now, if you say neurosis, that right away does that. If you say condition, the genus is for practical purposes simply empty. It doesn't uh, uh, tie it to any particular category of things and you can't bring whatever accumulated knowledge you have of mental illness to it. And therefore, certainly the genus is much too uh, uh, abstract and generalized here. Are there any other objections? Suppose we rewrote it, hypochondria is the uh, uh, mental condition where a person worries a great deal about his health. Would that be all right? Lady at the very back, I see it. Absolutely true. You say that's too broad because worry about your health can be justified. And of course it can if you've just been to a doctor and he tells you you have terminal cancer and, you know, uh, you have reason to believe him, let's say you're not committing varicundium. Uh, it is perfectly logical and rational to worry a great deal about your health. That is not hypochondriacal. So hypochondria, if you were to, to do that, you'd have to say the essence of the uh, differentia there is that the person has no rational grounds to worry about his health. It is groundless, imaginary worrying about uh, his health. And then if we wanted to go into the details of psychology, we could perhaps formulate, <clears throat> although I certainly wouldn't try that here, a more technical definition. If you have an overall theory of neurosis as involving, for instance, uh, anxiety and methods of dealing with it, then you could say it's a form in which you try to displace the, your anxiety by attaching it to imaginary physical ailments. But that already would involve you in the theory of neurosis, which if you could validate, you could give a still a more specific definition of what constituted hypochondria. But for a generalized definition, you would have to at least include as a direction that it's mental uh, aberration or neurosis, and that it consists of excessive concern about one's health groundlessly uh, without any objective basis. All right, let's go on to five. Happiness is what you feel when you get what you want. What you feel when you get what you want. Well, let's just begin, first of all, there's an incredible number of things you could say about this one. <coughs> In regards to the genus, what you feel, is that okay? It's not okay? 
I mean, assuming he means by what you feel an emotion, is that okay? If it's not, let's hear why not. Who, who would object simply to the genus, what you feel? Yeah, the lady. You think it should state that it's positive, that it's a positive feeling. All right, we could include that. That would be a little more uh, specific. But the general category is okay. It is an emotional state, as against a state of action or a state of thought, etc. Well, now, what's wrong with it, then? What you feel when you get what you want. What is the trouble uh, with that? I'm trying to take different people. Yes, sir. Well, is it too wide or too narrow? Well, give me one way or the other. For, tell me first, are you giving me too wide or too narrow right now? Well, give me one at a time, though. It's too wide. Why is it too wide? Because you say, if it's to be too wide, it has to be that this is applicable to something other than happiness. If it's too narrow, that means this is not true of all cases. Now, which you're saying is too wide or too narrow? Then it would be too narrow, if I follow your reasoning. You're saying, this is not true of all cases of happiness. There are some cases of happiness that it doesn't apply to. That is the definition of it being too narrow. Uh, can you give me a case where you can uh, uh, not get what you want and nevertheless be regarded as happy? I mean, give me an example. Oh, well, you say you can continue to be happy long after you've gotten it, presumably riding on the fact that you already got it, and you're nourishing that to your breast mentally, so to speak. So you're still feeding off of the fact that you got what you want, so that wouldn't be a very convincing an example. Do you have a point on this very point? Yes. Well, that's the same point he made. You can be happy about a memory, but that still rests upon that he got what he wants. Well... Let's look at it from this point of view. What about, uh, uh, take an example of Howard Rourke from the Fountainhead in the granite quarry. Now, there is an obvious sense in which he did not yet get what he wanted. Uh, if what he wanted was a career in architecture and the triumph of a certain kind of building, would you say that he was happy in the granite quarry? No, I would. And yet he did not get what, what he wanted. Now, how would you uh, encompass uh, that fact? Well, here, to go into it uh, uh, briefly, what I think the point is involved is you would have to distinguish between pleasure and happiness if you wanted to give a full, appropriate definition of happiness. There is a distinction between the term pleasure and happiness. Now, I'm nervous about the fact that people are taking notes. I'm not lecturing on this point now because... This is not one of our big five. I'm just throwing out some lead. <laughs> but uh, the generalized distinction is that pleasure names a short-term, surface uh, uh, emotional state. Uh, you get, uh, and it can oscillate back and forth. You can have pleasure or pain, pleasure, disappointment. Uh, and in that sense, it is a more superficial state. You get an A in a course and you feel pleasure or and then you go home and you phone your girlfriend or boyfriend up and they're busy that night and you feel sad and, and then you think if you're great again and you feel pleasure, etc. That's the kind of surface oscillation of pleasures and pain. Now, happiness, by contrast, I think, represents a fundamental enduring emotional state. It represents an attribute of the person's uh, uh, life. You can talk about a happy person, you see. You wouldn't talk about a pleased person as a type of uh, uh, individual. And you can have a, an essentially happy person who on that surface level of ups and downs is not getting what uh, he wants and is experiencing pain. And I think that would be true of the case cited of Rourke in the granite quarry. On the other hand, you can have an essentially unhappy person who remains unhappy even though on the surface level he is getting what he wants. For instance, one of those boisterous life of the party types, uh, who is surrounded by admirers, all of whom are laughing with him, or, and uh, he's getting his kicks, so to speak, uh, 
and is experiencing pleasure on one level, but fundamentally he is unhappy, insecure, etc. From that aspect, I think a proper full discussion of happiness would have to include reference to uh, something like this, that it's pleasure experienced on a metaphysical level in terms of your basic relationship to reality. Uh, and it involves not that you necessarily get what you want, but that you're confident of your basic uh, capacity to achieve what you want and uh, that what you want can be obtained in uh, reality. In that sense, I think for shorthand, but I wouldn't write this as a formal definition. I think of happiness as a kind of metaphysical pleasure, a pleasure pertaining to your basic relationship to reality and therefore your ability to achieve your value. Now, just uh, before we leave, there's many other things you could say about it. Oh, we've been on the aspect that it's too narrow. Can you think of an aspect from which it's too wide, in which uh, people get what they want and they are not happy? That's another type of objection. On the eye, yes. Could you give an example of somebody getting something they want and still being unhappy? Person getting a job that they want, but that they're terrified about, so they're in conflict, but they want it. And then they get what they want and they're petrified. And consequently, they don't experience happiness. Or the common example is the movie star, you know, that wants fame above all else and uh, gets it and then is miserable, insecure, etc. James Taggart wanted uh, the destruction of Cheryl and got it, but it was not made happy as a result. So for uh, an appropriate definition of happiness, you would have to include the, not just the idea that it's whatever you want, but that what you want, in other words, what you value, has to be rational, consistent, uh, non-contradictory, and that it's not simply any arbitrary uh, whim or desire, and that it is not true, therefore, that the satisfaction of any desire, no matter what, will make you uh, happy, which this definition certainly suggests. You could even make a point of picking on the word get in this uh, definition, this is if you want to be super uh, uh, critical of it, because there's a certain passivity implied in the word get what you want, as though the only thing required to be happy is that somehow or other you be provided with the satisfaction of your desires, and that it doesn't make any difference if any activity or effort on your part is put forth. And I think the best refutation of that view of happiness Namely, that it's simply the passive receptivity of uh, satisfying your desires without any a uh, action or effort necessary on your part. There was a magnificent uh, story on the old Twilight Zone uh, television show uh, written by Charles Beaumont. This was many years ago. If I just take a second to tell you, because I think it's the single most philosophical television show I ever saw, uh, brilliantly done, and the idea was a I'm no good at narrating stories. But the idea is it was a uh, gangster who died, and he uh, went to the other world. Uh, and uh, he found uh, there that, uh, to his surprise, anything he wanted, any wish he got, was instantly and automatically gratified. He wanted women, and he was surrounded with uh, admiring women. He wanted to hold up a bank and the police and everybody cooperated with him fully, and the tellers handed over the money. He wanted to gamble and win, and he won every time. And at a certain point, he says uh, to his mentor, who's following him around, arranging things for him, there's some mistake uh, uh, has been made. I can't stand it up here. I was a gangster uh, on Earth, but I simply can't stand the, the situation here you better send me to hell rather than to heaven. And the guy says to him in the last line, where do you think you are? <laughs> and uh, the obvious, <coughs> uh, it's better when you actually see it, uh, <coughs> but the obvious uh, uh, concept involved was that you cannot enjoy values unless there is some active effort an action and achievement on your part to gain them, and that if you are simply the passive recipient, it's unendurably uh, boring and meaningless. So I think you'd have to include the idea of achieving a value, not simply passively uh, 
receiving. Now we could go on with this, but we surely have enough. Let's whip off poison uh, here fairly quickly. Poison, anything which is virulent in its action or effect upon a living creature. Who objects to that? Yes, the lady. You say it's too broad. Well, anything <laughs> is certainly too broad. Uh, any substance would be better. And what uh, is too broad about the differentia? Oh, you, you're taking virulent in the sense of anything deadly or malignant, right? Well, if so, of course, then it's certainly too broad because getting stabbed, as you say, would be, would be a poison. Having your head chopped off with an axe would be a poison. Or from a completely different point of view, socialism would be a poison. So uh, if you take virulent as meaning anything destructive of the life of, a, of an organism, then, of course, it's certainly too broad. Actually, virulent is also used in a narrower sense to mean anything which is poisonous. And then, if, and that's what I had in mind in constructing this. And then, of course, you would say this is simply circular. It does not tell you uh, what poison this is. There is still another sense in which a virulent poison is distinguished, for instance, from a venomous poison, from toxins, etc. And if you took virulent in that narrow sense, the most narrow sense, then, of course, this definition is too narrow because it doesn't cover all poison. Now, as a direction, you'd have to indicate that it is a substance uh, which has a tendency to injure uh, health or destroy life when absorbed or ingested into the system. Be pardon? Or, or it could be, a, yes, it could be produced uh, by the system because the system can produce poisons, right? I will, you'd have to, if you wanted to be more specific, you'd have to go into chemistry, which I'm certainly not going to do. All right, let us plunge on because I certainly want to get to revolution before the break. Um, capitalism. A social system based on competition and the profit motive. Well, what do you say about that? Seems to have a reputable genus. It's a social system. Competition and the profit motive are uh, equivalent, to ca uh, equivalent in the sense that it's true of capitalism. So uh, what is the objection to this one? There's one overpowering objection. Yes, sir. It certainly violates the rule of fundamentality. What? Well, you say it, defi it describes effects rather than causes. Illustrate that. How does it define effects rather than causes? Yes, the genus is all right. You can say a social system, a socio-political system. But what is the effects here? Competition and the profit mode. What are they effects of? Well, certainly you couldn't have a profit motive if there wasn't private property. And therefore, private property is the absolute precondition of there being such a thing as a profit motive. And in that sense, profit motive is a derivative. And obviously, an equivalent is true of competition. Competition is possible only if there is such a thing as free, independent, individual action. And then, under those circumstances, if your right to individual action is guaranteed, when it's appropriate, individuals will compete, when it's appropriate. So these two are obviously derivatives, and the root which makes them possible is that it's the social system which recognizes individual rights, including property rights, in which property is privately owned. Now you see, the, therefore, that the fundamental objection here is that it is non-fundamental. And you see the disaster that would occur if you define capitalism this way, because the first thing you would do if you made competition, for instance, an essential of capitalism, rather than simply a derivative of individual rights, the first time somebody controls a large part of the market for a given commodity, even if there's no coercion involved, and he has that uh, control uh, strictly through his uh, efficiency, no one is able to compete with him, a horde of people will come out under rocks and say, well, this is a violation of capitalism. Capitalism is supposed to be competition. That's <clears throat> the essence of it. And here is somebody uh, that there's no competitors. Therefore, we will have to have a law that there must be competition. You would do that in the name of defending capitalism. Now, you can be sure if that happens, a conservative Republican legislature will pass uh, such a law in the name of saving capitalism and forcing people to be free, uh, which is, of course, what they did. <clears throat> 
whereas if you had to find capitalism clearly as an issue of individual rights, with everything that involves, you couldn't possibly get thrown off because you would see as soon as you're initiating governmental force, you're violating rights, and consequently whatever you're doing is anti-capitalist, it's not pro-capitalist. All right, I want to plunge on to revolution now. Now, rather than look at this one, which we have here, which is obviously uh, hopeless, as it's stated, if this is true, then the Nixon administration is a series of revolutions. This definition, because <laughs> the personnel and policies of the nation's government are certainly changed relatively swiftly. Uh, um, so that's obviously hopeless. Now, I would like to get a couple of definitions, not a voluminous number, and hopefully not too long, of uh, revolution. Who has one that they think is not too long that you could give to me that I could take down? Yes. Let's let me take that down now. A forcible, and you, the rest of you can take it down if you want, so we can study it later. A forcible attempt at a rapid shift in a major governmental policy, right? A forcible attempt at a rapid shift in a major governmental policy. All right. That is certainly one possibility. Uh, I don't yet say what I think of that, but you have certain central concepts uh, in there. It's perfectly clear cut as to what it says. Whether that is the proper definition of revolution, we'll see. Now, who has one that is significantly different? Now, by significantly different, uh, I don't mean that it has to be a revolution. Uh, compared to this one, but I mean, I don't want simply synonyms or rewording literarily, something that has some real substantive difference uh, from this one. Yes? Uh, a revolution is an overthrow of existing social institutions on the replacement of All right, let's take down that one. An overthrow of, say it again, existing social existing social institutions, yes and replacement with new ones. All right, that's certainly different. I take it by overthrow, you do not mean to imply forcible. Is that right? Yes. Oh, you do mean to imply overthrow, uh, forcible. So you're including then, I'll put that down, forcible overthrow, just to be clear then. Uh, and uh, the difference is then, from the first one, as far as I can see, is he makes the first one claims that it's simply an attempt to constitute a revolution. And your difference with him is that a revolution has to be successful. It has to actually replace and not simply attempt. So that's one difference. And uh, the second difference that I see is that he makes it an issue that all you have to do is attempt to change a specific governmental policy, albeit a major one, whereas you have to replace an entire social institution. Now, do you restrict it to a government by a social institution? You don't. Anything broadly that's characterized as a social institution. So you take it more widely than he does from that aspect. And uh, as I say, you also take the point that it must be successful and not simply an attempt. Now, I'll take one more, but I want uh, one that is enormously different from these two. Now, these two at least are pitched on the same generalized level. That is, they both involve a change in some social or political structure or policy. Did anybody take revolution as a much, much broader concept applicable beyond the whole realm of social, political institutions, governmental policies, etc.? In other words, a really uh, far-ranging definition that might include like the sexual revolution and the industrial revolution and the Kantian revolution and things like that. Does anybody have one on that level? Yes, at the very back on the, on the wall there, at the wall, yes. Oh, that sounds fine. Now let's get that one down. Now say it slowly, please. Uh, say it again. Just a few words at a time because I don't take shorthand. Yeah? Yes. I got that. Yeah. Is what? Swift? 
Swift and or comprehensive, yes. Okay. Swift and or comprehensive change in the fundamental premises and or policies of an individual of an individual group or conceptual discipline. A swift and or comprehensive change in the fundamental premises and or policies of an individual group or conceptual discipline, right? Now, there you're taking it in a very, very broad sense to encompass the type of things I said before and not simply social political. All right, now if we can leave those for a couple of minutes, let me go through for you before the break the reasoning that I went through to arrive at a definition of revolution and the kinds of considerations I weighed and then briefly apply it to uh, uh, these three. In the first a few minutes I'm just, just hold these and then we'll look at them. Now we are concerned here obviously with bringing out some principles of definition in general and not simply with revolution, so I wanted to discuss to a certain extent the broader points involved and not just revolution. And as an introductory word, I want to say that when you define something, you have to ask yourself at the outset if the term in question is used in different senses. Because if so, you have to specify at the outset the particular usage that you have in mind before you undertake to provide a definition. Now, a clear-cut case in this respect is the term trunk that we mentioned under equivocation a number of weeks ago. Now there, the word is used in two obviously different senses. Uh, trunk, many senses, but two we can single out. Trunk uh, in the sense of baggage that you take to uh, the railroad station, and trunk in the sense of the elephant's facial appendage. Now there is no connection, whatever. It's simply linguistic accident that the same word happens to stand for these two. It's pure equivocation, and it would not be applicable in other languages. Now here, it would be a fundamental mistake to try to find a common denominator for your definition. Uh, and if you uh, undertook to define trunk, you'd have to at the outset say, I'm going to define trunk in, let us say, the Grand Central sense, or I'm going to define trunk in the elephant sense, and then proceed about your business. Now that's called let us call that for short the trunk case. And the mistake would be looking for a common denominator which does not exist. Now there is an opposite type of error, and that is failing to find a common denominator which does exist. And here we can use the term morality, the concept morality. Now someone might, for instance, observe that objective has used the term morality to stand for a code of values, let us say, embodied by John Galt. And Christians use the term morality to stand for a code of values, let us say, embodied by Jesus. And these two codes of values are, of course, profoundly opposed in a great many respects. But it would nevertheless be a grave error to say that this is like the trunk case and that this is uh, an equivocation. It is not an equivocation. And even though there are profound differences between those two applications of the concept, there is one common denominator which is crucial and which runs through both. Namely, the abstraction, a code of values accepted by choice. Even though the particular concretes are enormously different, that abstraction runs through and is common to both. And there are a great many intellectual contexts where that concept of morality as such apart now from the particular content of any particular school, is crucial. And you would uh, wreak havoc, for instance, with ethics if you didn't have such a concept as morality as such. You couldn't, for instance, raise such a question as, does man need morality? Why does he need morality? Because morality would already be identified in advance as a specific code of values. You couldn't say about any theory, this is a rational code of morality, because morality would be pre preempted in advance to mean only one particular code. And therefore, you would find that you needed desperately a concept to cover what is common to any set of values accepted by choice, and that's the concept named by morality. Well, so far, then, we have the trunk case, where we have the same word, 
used in completely unrelated sentences, and let's call it the morality case, where there's enormous differences among the concretes, but there is still one literal and important concept which subsumes all those differences. Now against that background, let us look at the revolution case. I deliberately chose it because it is, in effect, in between. It is neither of these cases exactly. It represents a third and trickier type of situation which frequently comes up when you engage in definitions. Now, if you approach revolution, on the one hand, you might incline the way the first two people did tonight, to say that revolution is fundamentally a social or political concept. And you might then, if you took that line, say, as far as the other uses of, more, of a revolution, the broad uses encompassing the sexual revolution, so-called the industrial revolution, you might say those are simply metaphors, not literal instances of the concept. Now you're familiar, I'm sure, with what is meant by a metaphorical usage. A metaphorical usage represents a loose, extended use of a concept on the basis of some similarities, which it has to the, in, to the original use. But it is not, insofar as it's a metaphor, in itself a literal concept, nor is it therefore to be given a formal definition in that usage. Now, for instance, who is it, Tennyson, that said that the Valiant 400 marched into the jaws of death. Now, if you were defining jaws, you would not say, I have to have a definition that includes the jaws of human beings and of various animals and the jaws of death. Because you would understand that jaw, taken as a literal concept, designates an anatomical feature. And when you talk about the jaws of death, that is a metaphorical extension of the concept. It's simply a shorthand way of saying when a person dies, it has certain similarities to him vanishing into the jaws of uh, some animal. But it is not, in its metaphorical use, subject to a literal definition. Now, one thing you could do, therefore, when you approach revolution, one thought that may occur to you is, I'm going to define it fundamentally as a social-political concept. And then, I'm going to make its other uses, construe its other uses as simply metaphorical, in the same way that the jaws of death is. Or you could say, no, revolution is a literal concept, a general, broad, literal concept that has remained the same throughout all the various uses. And the social or political revolution is merely one concrete. And therefore, the proper way of pitching this definition is to give a definition of revolution that will cover everything that comes under it. Now you see why I chose it. This is a situation which is not like the trunk case, because there is obviously some close relationship between the various usages, as in political revolution, sexual revolution, etc. That is not equivocation. But we are not prepared yet to say at the outset that it's like the morality case, because we are not certain at the outset, is there one literal valid concept running through all the uses or not? Now, the question is, by what method will you solve this very common type of problem? When can you say there is one broad concept involved? When should you focus on a specific concrete and say the rest is simply metaphorical extension? You get the problem that is posed by this type of concept. Now, if you get the problem, by what means will we go about answering? Well, if you are un unsure, I believe that the most convenient thing to do is to begin with the hypothesis that it is one general concept, applicable to all its instances literally. You don't always have to do that, but in many cases that is true, <clears throat> because a concept by its nature is a wide-scale integration of concretes. And therefore, other things being equal, if you completely don't know which way to go, start with the attempt to work out a definition of the widest usage of the term. See what its definition would be. And then remind yourself of the function of concepts, which I won't here recapitulate except to say that the essential function of a concept is to integrate a whole host of concretes and an unlimited number to differentiate them from everything else, and then integrate them into a unit for purposes of specialized study. Well, do this with the concept in question. Give it a definition, and then ask, is the concept that you have thereby defined so generalized 
that it is comparatively useless for purposes of special study? Or does the concept thus defined name some fundamental similarity of things which requires conceptualization? Do you have a significant concept at the end? Or are you integrating into your wide concept such an enormous diversity of dissimilar things, such an effect a motley crew of concretes, that there is simply no point to having a concept on that broad a level? Now, depending upon how your answer comes out, you will either say, the concept construed this broadly is either no point or no validity, and therefore, I won't construe it this broadly. I'll take the narrower approach and regard the wider uses as metaphorical. Or if it comes out OK on the wide level, OK. Now let's try with revolution. Let me sketch in how I went about this. <clears throat> I began with the hypothesis of one general concept. So I began by ranging over concretes to try to get a wide enough sample. So I listed the American Revolution the Russian Revolution, the French Revolution, and at a certain point I got the message that those are political revolutions, but I wanted to get broader examples, so then I thought of the Kant claims his philosophy was the Copernican Revolution, that he upset all of philosophy, the Industrial Revolution, the Sexual Revolution, etc. Now, just to give you the details of the steps I went through, at a certain point my mind thought, what about the revolution of the Earth around the Sun? And then I thought, no, no, that doesn't count. Even as a preliminary candidate, that's out, because that obviously pertains to circular uh, motion, to revolving, not from the concept of revolting. And therefore, that is simple equivocation, and I throw that out right there. Now, if you try to get the revolution of the Earth around the sun and phonograph records, which are 78 revolutions per minute, along with all the rest, it's hopeless completely. So you have to, at this point, throw out the things which are blatantly, obviously, equivocations. But having given some, let us say, all right, we'll try a definition on this wide level. Now, what kind of definition? Well, the first thing that was obvious, it is some type of change, some mode of change. So my first attempt at a genus was it some mode or type of change. And then I thought, well, can I restrict the genus even more? Can I narrow it? And I thought, yes, revolution obviously pertains in some sense to human attitudes or actions, even in this broad sense as against, for instance, inanimate matter. If there was a sudden, of course, there couldn't be on metaphysical grounds, but suppose there was a sudden radical change in the behavior of matter, you would not say nature revolted. So that revolution would obviously be restricted even on the wide level to a change pertaining to human attitudes and actions. Now I thought, well, if I take that as a genus, what would I take as a differentia? Well, what am I trying on this broad level to differentiate revolution from? And I thought, well, the obvious thing you try to differentiate revolution from is evolution. And what is the difference there? Obviously, the rate of the change. And so for something to qualify as a revolution, it has to be in some sense sudden, immediate, rapid, as against slow, cumulative, etc. Now I thought, well, would that be enough? Could I just say a rapid change pertaining to human attitudes or actions? And I thought, no, that obviously is going to be too broad because I can think of examples of rapid changes of human, uh, pertaining to human attitudes and actions that couldn't possibly qualify as revolutions, except in a humorous sense. Now I remember, for instance, there was an Eastern Airlines ad uh, many years ago, and I think the headline of the front was on the top was, Eastern Airlines introduces a revolution. And the text uh, was that the stewardesses now smile. Uh, and that was their revolution. And I thought, obviously, that was a humorous usage. Presumably, it was humorous. But in any event, that would not qualify as a revolution, because otherwise, any time you picked up a cigarette, that's a change. But it's not a revolution. So a revolution can't be some superficial or insignificant change. It has to be something, in some sense, important, radical, fundamental, uh, significant. So I worked at this point in the state of saying, well, let's try as a definition a rapid, fundamental change in human attitudes or practices. That would be now, uh, uh, in, in put in brief, my generalized uh, definition. 
Uh, now, this is, as far as I can see, essentially what definition three was that was put forth. He has that it's a swift and or comprehensive change. Well, uh, uh, I believe that if you do not make it swift, if you simply make it a comprehensive change, but you allow it to take place very slowly and gradually, you will not distinguish revolution from evolution. And therefore, I think that would be a deficiency in this formulation number three. And he includes that it must be the fundamental premises or policies. Uh, and he also goes on to indicate that it's individuals, groups, or conceptual disciplines. But in essence, with those few amendments, I think this is the level on which this definition uh, that I uh, pitched it on first is. Now, before I accept that, though, as a definition, because remember, we also had in mind the idea that it is a specifically political concept and that this might not be one literal concept. I want to ask myself, does this concept revolution, as I've now tentatively defined it, does it integrate a significantly similar group of concretes? Is there some significant fundamental in common? Or do I have what I refer to as a motley crew of things subsumed under one term that I couldn't do anything with? Well, the first thing I try and do is see, what am I committed to? What kind of territory would this take in? A rapid fundamental change in human attitudes or practices. Well, I think a friend goes insane overnight. That's rapid. It's surely fundamental uh, change in his attitudes. It may involve a fundamental change in his premises. If he thinks he's Napoleon, that's surely about as fundamental as you can get. Is that a revolution? I think, no, that is not a revolution. That's bad news for him, but it's not a revolution. Well, might I amend this or reinterpret it so as to exclude that? I think, well, maybe it has to be a rapid change on the part of a whole group, a whole society, uh, a whole nation. And then I think, well, no, even then, what if nerve gas, there was nerve, germ warfare, and nerve gas was sprayed on an entire country, and the whole country went insane overnight? Would that be a revolution? Well, by my definition, it's a rapid fundamental change in uh, human attitudes or practices. But I say, if I'm going to use, if I'm going to include this type of thing in the definition, then I've got a concept that is so wide that there is no significant common denominator left. I, what it comes to, in simple language, is a big rapid change in lots of people. And to do anything with a concept like that, you would immediately have to ask, what kind of change? Caused by what? Otherwise, it's simply amorphous, and you can't go anywhere with it. So I already have a grave doubt from the sheer, uh, a virtually contentless generality of this concept as to whether a literal concept is involved. Now we try another test and ask, let's look at it, so to speak, from the point of view of reality. Suppose you were alone on a desert island, so there's no question of how people use the word linguistically. Would the facts necessitate the forming of this particular concept thus defined? Now here, of course, you'd have to know history. You have to assume a well-stocked library on a desert island. But assuming that, would the facts necessitate forming this kind of concept? Or does it lack a true metaphysical basis? In other words, would you need such a concept? And if you'll ask, uh, you ask that type of question, you would see, <coughs> I think, that there really is no metaphysical basis for a concept of revolution pitched this broadly. For one reason, most of the things called revolutions are not rapid. The changes in actual fact are very slow. They take place in layer after layer and level after level, and it's only the very last stage of a continuous accumulation of small changes where it becomes obvious to everyone and it finally makes the cover of Time magazine and is then called rapid. But if you think about it metaphysically from the nature of man, you'd say human beings cannot change rapidly on a fundamental level. By the very nature of man, if they are to change on a fundamental level, that has to be a slow, painstaking process where they grasp new ideas and slowly integrate them and apply them, connect them, make broader and broader use of them, etc. And therefore, if you look at what's called the sexual revolution, 
Actually, of course, that has been going on since the Renaissance, uh, gradually across time. And the same is true of the Kantian revolution. It took well over a century before that was entrenched, etc. Now I say to myself, therefore, to sum up, it seems to have no metaphysical validation, no basis or need in reality, nothing in the nature of man that calls for such a concept. And at the same time, if I define it, it seems to come out to be a motley collection of instances of w with which I can do comparatively little. Now, when a concept comes out like that, I say, by the principle of concept economy, you know, Ms. Rand's razor, concepts are not to be multiplied beyond necessity, you say, then if it has that kind of uh, status, it's not appropriate, don't define it on that level. All right, so having gone through all that, I say, let me try the other tack. Let's take the outstanding use of it, the political use, which in different forms the first two uh, instances, the first two definitions submitted uh, suggested. Let's define now on that level and then see if we can explain the other uses as simply metaphorical extensions. Now, our first broad approach to the concept was not useless by any means. You will find that it's helpful because it will give you many leads and clues, even if you find that what you get when you reach the general concept is not in that form necessarily uh, a usable concept. You'll get many leads. So I say, all right, I'm going to restrict revolution in my mind to the kind of things like the Russian Revolution, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, etc. In other words, to the specifically political set. So then I say to myself, all right, what will be the genus? Well, it's a change, but this time obviously a political change, a change in a country's government. Uh, that will be in the narrow sense what is a revolution. I mean, that will be its genus, a change in a country's government. Well, then, of course, you think right away there's all kinds of changes in a country's government. Uh, every time you have a new election, you have new men, that's not a revolution. You can even have many new measures like the New Deal in relation to the Hoover administration. It's still not a revolution. But I think, well, what have I accomplished by saying a revolution is a process of change? I have accomplished something because I've distinguished revolution, for instance, from rebellion. Now, I think that's the flaw in definition number one that was put forth here. If we're going to define revolution, we have to remember what we're distinguishing it from. There's all kinds of uprising against the established government, which are not therefore revolutions. There are rebellions, insurrections, riots, etc. And therefore, if we say any attempt at a change, then of course we will have drowned revolution in rebellion, insurrection, riot, etc. Now, one of the commonest ways to distinguish a revolution from a rebellion is that a revolution is an uprising which succeeds as against a rebellion where it's an attempt, but it doesn't. And then, of course, if we were really going into this, but I'm not going to spend the whole night on revolution, we'd have to distinguish it from uh, insurrection and riots, but those are local uprisings in any event. And we're here defining it in terms of the country's government. But so by defining it as actual change uh, uh, in a country's government, we get something established. But we still have to, of course, differentiate it from other types of change. Well, I look back to my broad original definition, and I saw that the idea of fundamental was involved in my first attempt, and I think that equally applicable here. A fundamental change. In other words, it's a, a new system of government established in some crucial respect, not simply a change in some measures or some personnel of the old one. Uh, if one communist regime replaces another in a purge, there might be some change in personnel and change in policies, but that's not a revolution. The New Deal wasn't a revolution when it came. But if a communist country goes free enterprise, or a free enterprise country goes fascist, or even if a communist country goes Nazi, then other things being equal, there would be a great number of consequences on a certain level, at least, and you can say, okay, uh, this is a significant, a fundamental change. Well, is that enough? It's simply a fundamental change in a nation's government. And they know because there can be different kinds of fundamental change. Suppose it's a quiet change, peaceful, the new government was voted in, there was no fighting, no war, or anything like that. It would obviously not be a revolution. For instance, no, you don't call the takeover of Hitler the Nazi revolution. 
because he was constitutionally, democratically elected in full accord with all the laws and constitutional provisions of the Weimar Republic. So you think to yourself, I have to add in the idea that a revolution is something caused by a forcible or physical uprising as it gains simply a peaceful, uh, if you'll forgive the expression, democratic, or, or don't cut me off in mid-flight now, peaceful or electoral uh, um, uh, change. But we still say to ourselves, well, what about putsches or coup d'etat? There is, it can be a fundamental change. It can be forcible, but that is not a revolution. We want to distinguish revolution from a coup or a putsch, depending on which language you speak. Uh, and what is the distinction? Well, in one case, you're dealing with a small group, a conspiracy on the part of a small number, whereas what you call a revolution is something which has widespread popular support, is what makes it a revolution, as distinct from simply a, a, a putsch or a takeover by a small group. Now, by that process, and I've condensed some of the steps, I end up with a conclusion like this. A fundamental change in a nation's system of government brought about by a forcible uprising with widespread popular support. That's what I finally end up with, in essence. Now, before I would ever publish that, I'd go over it literarily, and maybe you could condense it and smooth it out and make it shorter. But the central idea would be a fundamental change in a nation's system of government brought about by a forcible uprising with widespread uh, uh, popular support. Now, I've indicated what I uh, object to in the first one. I object, as I said, to the issue of a forcible attempt. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's enough to simply change a policy. It's changing a policy begins to revert back to the very generalized definition and will give you such a number of concretes that you'll never know when something is a revolution. The second definition is the closest of mine. And the, uh, that is to say, the forcible overthrow of existing social institutions and replacement with new ones. But by making it social institutions, and not specifically restricting it to government, it becomes so broad again that it's in danger of collapsing into the first broad definition we gave. And again, by not indicating widespread popular support, it will allow any takeover or putsch to be uh, a revolution. Now, I, so that's just a brief comments on the one submitted. Of the three, the second is the closest to what I would accept with the suggestions that I, I mentioned. Now I ask in conclusion, I still have to account for those remaining uses of the term revolution that I haven't encompassed in my, my definition. Can I understand those as metaphorical extensions? And I say to myself, well, obviously, they share with political revolution some of its features. For instance, a fundamental change, and that's generalized, obviously, from the idea of a fundamental political change, and a rapid change. And that obviously derives from the original political usage, because a revolution is a violent or physical uprising, which is therefore necessarily short-lived and takes place very rapidly, because people can't live for a protracted period under uh, the reign of a violent uprising. So I think to myself, what it must be is like this. People are saying when they talk about the sexual revolution, the change in sexual mores since the Renaissance is like a political revolution in certain respects. And at first they undoubtedly said it that way. They said this is just like a revolution in certain ways. At a certain point they dropped the like and they simply said it is a revolution, and it, but it was clearly understood like the jaws of death. And then as time went on, it lost its original metaphorical connotation, and it reached the point where it is now, which is to say that it's in the borderline, and you can't tell when you first look at it, is this simply a metaphorical extension, or is there one uh, valid concept? And to decide, you have to start from scratch and go through the whole thing, uh, as I tried to indicate. Well, so much for revolution. I hope you get some of the wider uh, aspects involved. Let's take a short break and then we'll plunge ahead. Thank you. All right, I am going to, in the light of the hour, change our policy. Uh, this always happens with an active class on definitions you could spend if you wanted the whole three hours on one concept, and instructively, but uh, we're terribly far behind. So the minimum we absolutely must do tonight is the rest of the big five. <laughs>
and then we can polish off the ones where all we have to do is point out fallacies. So let's jump straight to 14, fascism, and do the in, four remaining ones left, and then in whatever time we have, uh, r rattle through the ones that we just have to point out fallacies. In. Number 14, fascism is a totalitarian system of government characterized by brutality, anti-Semitism, and private property. Now that is, in effect, a working liberal definition of fascism. And uh, uh, on this basis of this kind of definition, I've heard, on the one hand, people argue that the United States has no tendency toward fascism because there's no anti-Semitism in the country, which is an essential of fascism, according to this definition. On the other side, I've heard people far on the left say the country is appro approaching fascism because, of course, it has private property. And uh, Nixon, they claim, is a totalitarian. Now, uh, therefore, this definition is obviously can lead to uh, hopeless consequences. And I don't think we need to spend much time criticizing this definition as it is. Once you say a totalitarian government, uh, it is irrelevant to include uh, brutality, which would be simply one expression and which would be much wider than uh, totalitarianism. Any autocracy would in involve brutality. Anti-Semitism is obviously much too narrow uh, uh, to include in fascism because that was not a salient characteristic of fascism in Italy or Japan. And private property is simply false. Uh, and as a direct contradiction, a totalitarian system with private property is a self-contradiction. Property is an individual right, and a totalitarian system is one that denies all individual rights. So the most you could say as a factual point, not yet saying whether we'd include it in the definition, is that it retains the forms of private property, the facade, the superficial paper formality of private property, but without the reality of an individual having the right to use and dispose of that property as he chooses. But whether we include that in the definition is we haven't yet decided. And that's simply to polish off this mess which is given here as number 14. Now, does anybody have a definition they want to offer of fascism in place of this positively? Now, is this some, you didn't contribute to revolution, right? You weren't a revolutionary. All right, let's hear your, let's hear your fascism. A form of socialism in which title to property is nominally held by the citizens, but the government controls production and trade. All right, you say, it is a form of socialism as your genus. And say it again, in which the government... In which title to property. Oh, yes, with nominal property. Let's put it that way, for, just for abbreviation. You say title to property was what? Uh, nominally held by the citizens. N title to property is nominally held by the citizens. We'll just condense that to the idea of nominal property. In other words, property in name, but not in reality. And what else did you have? Uh, but the government controls production But the government controls production and trade. So... You make uh, fascism, as you define it, essentially an economic phenomenon, if I understand you correctly. That is, you pitch it on the, the you, you, political economic, but your focus of your definition is that it's an economic system, because the facts that you involve, that you, you point out, are the status of property relations and the government's control of production and trade. So you're calling it, uh, in a general sense, a social system, but you're obviously focusing on economics as the essence of fascism. Now, do we have a significantly different definition of fascism that does not make it essentially an economic uh, system in the way uh, this does? Yes. Now, the in which there is now private property, the well, yours is a little broader. You say, you know, you say it is a social system as against simply a form of socialism. So you have a broader genus, right? And now, your differentiation was you also include the idea of nominal property, right? And uh, what did you say that happened to the individual? But the individual exists solely to serve the state. Now, your difference is therefore is that you pitch it a little more broadly than the first definition. 
Instead of restricting it, the genus to socialism, you make it as broad as social system. You agree that the issue of nominal private property is central. Presumably you want to differentiate it there from both of you from communism. And where uh, the first one uh, restricts in the definition the, gov the issue of the government control of production and trade, you pitch it more broadly to make the state in control of everything and the individual exists solely to serve the state, not simply in production and trade, but in every activity. So there is a certain similarity and a certain tendency to a broader approach uh, on your part. Now if we had time we could take many more, but I don't want to uh, kill too much time on fascism. So let's just work with those two and let's keep those for a moment. And uh, um, uh, let me indicate to you what I went through, but this time not nearly in the length, the painful length of revolution, and uh, then take a look at these two uh, definitions. Now, on the, to begin with, I said <clears throat> you have to decide are you using fascism in the narrow or the broad sense? because it is very often used as a general name of a type of political system which would include Nazism, the Italian version, the Japanese version, etc. Or sometimes it is contrasted to Nazism in a special study, in which case fascism is reserved specifically for the Italian uh, system under Mussolini. It was, of course, originally the name of the Italian system. Now, both of these uses of the term fascism are perfectly legitimate. But uh, for <clears throat> significant political purposes now, it is simply a historical curiosity, as far as we're concerned, that Mussolini's system was originally called fascism. So I decided that for uh, real value to the concept uh, as a definitional exercise, let us assume we are using fascism to encompass all of those similar systems and not simply Mussolini's as contrasted to Hitler. Well, the first question is, how do you subdivide? Uh, what is your genus? And that, of course, depends on how you subdivide the field. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, it depends on what you're trying to contrast it with. <clears throat> now, if you're coming to the issue of politics and economics fresh from scratch, you might say, well, I want to distinguish fascism from capitalism, socialism, uh, communism, the welfare state, etc. The common denominator of all these is a social system or a social political system. If so, you'll get the genus that definition number two gave, namely, a social system. And I would not say that is in any sense wrong. That is a broadly defined genus, which does indicate the category that it belongs to, quite sufficient to anchor it to the rest of your knowledge. I would not, however, say that it is wrong to give a narrower genus in this case. This depends on your political philosophy and your knowledge of the field. But suppose that by the time you get to fascism and to the question of defining it, you have already mapped out the field of social political philosophies and you have made a fundamental distinction between two types of social political uh, system, namely individualist and, let us say, collectivist. Suppose you have already made that basic distinction, which is, of course, a fundamental and valid distinction. In that case, I would then say, use as your genus a type of collectivism, which would be better simply on the grounds of the rule of fundamentality. If you define it as a form of collectivism, you thereby tie it more fundamentally to the other systems in terms of fundamental similarities. And it's not quite so abstract a, a, a genus, a social political system, which would not be wrong but it then doesn't give you as concisely as fundamental information as it would if you call it a form of, social, uh, of collectivism. Now, I, the, the first definition that we were given, use that approach, but use the term socialism. Now that, I think, is uh, optional. It depends entirely on how you define socialism, and several alternative definitions are valid, and what you would have to do is make clear what uh, you are using the term socialism to mean. If you are using the term socialism in the very broad sense to mean collective, the supremacy of the collective over the individual, of the group over the individual, whether that is implemented in the fascist form or the communist form or whichever, then you can say that Nazism, uh, that fascism is a form of socialism. And in that sense, of course, it was the 
Mussolini advocated guild socialism and Nazism, uh, Nazism means national socialism, etc. However, there is also a use of socialism in which socialism is used much more narrowly to stand for, in effect, what its advocates frequently call democratic socialism, and which they then contrast to, and there are certain differences between it and fascism and communism. If you use it in that narrow sense, then of course it would not be an appropriate uh, genus. I myself would prefer the term collectivism as the genus to socialism because it's unmistakable and states the essence of the meaning. And I don't see any need to haggle over whether the Nazis are socialist or not uh, because collectivism says the essence of what uh, they, they are, what the fascists are. And then whether you say that uh, socialism is synonymous with collectivism, well, if so, it's a dispensable term, or it's a specific version is irrelevant. Therefore, I myself treat collectivism as the genus for that reason. But now we go on, obviously it would not be, uh, now I say again, it would not be wrong to call it a social political system, but for the reason I mentioned, I'd prefer to give it as a, a, a genus, a collectivist system. But then I immediately come across the point that there are many types of collectivist system other than fascism. There is what's called democratic socialism, if we can call it that, which I won't here explain what that is, but that's the idea that you have uh, complete government control at least of a great many things uh, arrived at by vote. And there is the welfare state, which is a collectivist system of a lesser degree. So what is the difference in this respect then between a fascist collectivism and these other forms? And the obvious thing which immediately occurs is fascism is a version of totalitarianism. In other words, it doesn't simply claim to control one aspect or many aspects of the uh, citizen's life, but it claims complete control over every aspect of the citizen's life and the complete abolition of freedom in every respect. Now you see the advocates of the welfare state and even the normal advocate of democratic socialism insists that he does not want a totalitarian system. It's a different question to if you wanted to argue as a matter of philosophy that his system would lead to totalitarianism, but as he defines it, he insists, oh, we want to preserve freedom of the press, and etc. But now, distinctive to fascism is that it is totalitarianism. In fact, the term totalitarian, I believe, was coined by Mussolini or was a derivative from his usage. They pride themselves on the absolute, complete, thoroughgoing control. So that one of the Nazi officials was famous for his line, uh, in Germany, the only private citizen is one who is asleep. But the idea that the moment you are awake, you are subject to the control of the state. And therefore, you see, I would object to the formulation in the first one that pitches it in the first definition that was suggested simply as government control of production and trade. I think that's simply one aspect. It's government control of production and trade and thought and press and uh, chess clubs and rotary clubs and any conceivable aspect of uh, uh, human life. And therefore, I think the second definition was better from the broad aspect of indicating the totalitarian uh, element. But now, of course, we still have, so we would say a collectivist, a form of collectivism which is totalitarian so far. But then, of course, we still have communism to uh, distinguish fascism from. It's also a form of collectivism and it's also totalitarian. But what is uh, the distinction? Well, here I think right away there are two points of distinction between uh, communism and fascism. I mean, two significant points that would conceivably be candidates. One of them is the issue mentioned in both of the definitions submitted, namely the issue of nominal private property, the facade of private property, as against uh, communism where you have formal nationalization. Now, uh, this does have certain consequences. It explains certain things about the operation of a fascist system. It explains, for instance, how Hitler could appeal to the middle class and even to certain big businessmen to get elected, whereas the communists could not pitch their propaganda that way. It explains certain things about why the Nazis let uh, uh, certain groups of people in certain economic strata remain alive, whereas those people are slaughtered right off under communism, etc. So that's at least a candidate but uh, for a differentia to distinguish it. But before I settle on that, I ask, is there anything else that distinguishes communism from Nazism, uh, from fascism? 
excuse me, I have Nazism on the brain because of my book, so I keep saying Nazism instead of fascism. Now, yes, there is one obvious thing that neither of these definitions refer to, which is nevertheless essential to the philosophy and the practice of fascism. And that is the nature of the collective that they appeal to and that they exalt above the individual and in the name of which the government is totalitarian. And there, of course, the central difference is that the fascist mentality chooses a racial or a national group, like the Aryans or the Italians or whatever it happens to be. Whereas the communists pick a collective which is economically defined, not biologically or nationally. The proletariat, you see, which is supposed to be an international group, cutting across racial and national lines. Uh, now, there are a number of key differences. I wouldn't uh, say that there's that much difference, because I don't think there's that much difference between communism and fascism to begin with. But the, on a narrower level, there are a number of differences that follow between the fascist and the communist system from this. What kind of individuals they persecute. Uh, the whole nature of their propagandistic uh, campaigns, the way in which they formulate their epistemologies, their metaphysics, their ethics, etc. This permeates the whole formulation of their philosophies. And therefore, I would say, if our criterion is fundamentality, how much is explained, then the issue of racial national versus uh, economic international explains more about the differences between fascism and communism than the issue of the facade of uh, private property. Now, at this point, I think you have an option. If you wanted to say, the one that explains most of the differences is the racial national issue. The issue of property uh, being uh, nominal explains certain things, but not that much. And uh, therefore, I don't regard that as essential. If we had Adolf Hitler and everything was the same, except he got up one day and said, there is no private property, it all belongs to the state, it would still be a fascist system. So it wouldn't change that much, and as a matter of fact, uh, fact uh, um, several of the Nazis, once they took power, came out with formal statements that all property is common property. And consequently, that difference in actual practice and even in theory didn't last too long. Now, if you looked at it that way, you could argue the facade of private property is not too central. And therefore, you'd simply say a form of collectivism which is totalitarian and racist, racist or nationalist. Or you could say, well, even so, there is some differences that follow from the issue of the facade of private property. And if I include that also, I will help to give a clearer picture of the distinction from communism. And I don't have an unwieldy catalog that can't be retained. And on that grounds, you could make a case for including it in the definition, in which case you would then say a form of collectivism, which is totalitarian, racist, nationalist, and preserves the facade of private property. Now, from the point of view of completeness, that might be preferable to include both elements. You see, we can't see any necessary connection between being racist and having the facade of private property. So you can't say one of them follows from the other. So your choice is either pick the one which explains the most, or in a case like this where you have two features and it's not too long to encompass, throw them both in for the same price. And that I would myself tend to do. And therefore, I would include the facade of private property, but I would not insist on it because I don't think that compares in importance to the distinction between the racist nationalist uh, versus the other one. Now, I've indicated, therefore, by omitting the issue of racial national collectivism, I think is the central deficiency of both of the definitions uh, uh, suggested, and I've commented on the rest. Now, let us jump to freedom. Now remember, our point here is not to become expert revolutionaries or fascists, but simply to uh, try and grasp the broader principles and the type of situations that might come up. What number is um, freedom is 17? Yes. You have a question that's right on this? Yes. So your definition of fascism is different from the national law, such as King Henry VIII. Does it differentiate it from absolute monarchy? 
yes, I think it does differentiate it from absolute monarchy. I don't want to go into a treatise on that, but I think totalitarianism in the sense I meant. That is not simply the claim that the state has unlimited right to exercise power over the individual, but the actual unlimited use of that is a 20th century phenomenon, essentially. Absolute monarchy claimed to have unlimited power, but couldn't exercise it in actual practice. And there was a certain, therefore, freedom by default uh, that the citizens had. Also, it was not collectivist in the modern uh, sense of the term of regarding the collective as a group. The king got his mandate normally from God, the divine right of kings. But I don't want to go into too much. I'm sorry, we have to go on to freedom now because we have a schedule. So let us turn to freedom. I understand that there are many questions you could ask, but try and just absorb the logic of the issue without uh, uh, getting ourselves too lost in the details of the particular example. Number 17, freedom is a state in which a man can do what he wants to do. A man can do what he wants to do. So, for instance, then, uh, if you want to become president of the United States and you can't, you can't do what you want to do, you're not free. If you want to earn $10 million a month, and you can't, you're not free. Uh, you want to live without work and nobody will support you, then you're not free, uh, etc. There's obviously something badly wrong with this definition. All right, let us hear if anybody has a suggestion for a definition of, what is it, freedom? You know, freedom or free, you can take it either way, the adjective or the noun. Who has one to offer? You have a comparatively brief one? No. Okay, shoot. Uh, freedom is the uh, individual right to produce your own food one home. Freedom is the individual right to produce, and, I'm taking it down, and own the fruits of one's own labor. The fruits of one's own labor. Right. The individual right to produce and own the fruits of one's own labor. All right, that certainly is a clear-cut definition of freedom uh, in which you, well, I won't criticize it. All right, it's, let's leave it for the moment. The individual right to produce and own the fruits of one's own labor. So the, to, just to paraphrase and I hope in not a pejorative way, the essence of freedom by this is the right of property, right? You're formulating, in essence, the right of property. So freedom is in effect the right of private property. Now, who has an, a significantly different one? I don't want just a linguistic reformulation of this, but an idea which is significantly different. You do, yes. All right, freedom is the state of being unconstrained by other humans. Now, that is certainly a much broader definition. It doesn't yet say whether it's better or worse, but it's certainly much broader. Uh, it doesn't focus specifically on property, and in fact, it's not even entirely clear to me whether if someone took your property, would you regard that as being constrained? You should include in it just say something about a legal system. Uh, a legal system that protected property, you mean, among other things. Well, that was uh, starting to get a little vague. Let's keep it as you had it originally, the state of being unconstrained by other humans, because I think there's a certain virtue and a certain vice in that formulation, which will be illuminated. Now, I'll take one more, but this time I want a, a still broader one, if anybody has one. That is something that is even broader uh, than the issue of being unconstrained by other humans. Does anybody have it even broader? You do? Yes. Well, you're still restricting it to human beings, though, right? You're still saying freedom is a characteristic only of human beings, right? But you have it couched, if I heard you correctly, as the pursuit? But I'd like to know, did anybody, uh, I don't mean to slight your definition, but just to get a variety here, did anybody define freedom in so broad a term that you could apply it to inanimate objects? Because there is a use of that in English. For instance, free fall. The object is falling freely. Uh, 
Now, did anybody pitch a definition on a level to encompass something that broad? Yes. State without restraints. Now, you see, that is what I would call a broad definition. <laughs> now, I don't mean that sarcastically or critically. But you see, uh, what I wanted to indicate by getting some definitions in advance is we have here, again, in a way similar to the revolution issue, a question of how broadly should we pitch this concept. Now, we have here three perfectly good examples of the extremes that you could take on that one issue. The narrowest restricts it to private property interference. The middle one, the second one, any interference by other humans uh, with uh, particularly a human being. And the third one simply says any state without restraints which does not restrict it even to human beings. Now, those are three completely different levels on which to pitch it. Now, let me again go through, hopefully not in a greater length, what I went through uh, on this one, and then come back and comment on these. Now, again, this is a term like revolution that there is a whole bunch of usages of. So the first thing I did, assuming you know, that I didn't have a definition in advance, and you're trying to actually work one out, is go through and think, well, what are some typical uses? Let your mind range just to get some idea of what you're talking about. So the obvious is a free man in the political sense. And then I thought right away of free will. Now, is that is not the same use as free man exactly, because you have free will in Soviet Russia, but you don't, you're not a free man there. And then, of course, I went to a free, will, uh, f uh, free fall in gravity, uh, uh, with a, where a thing falls uh, without any friction, etc. And then I thought, well, you talk about a, this man has a free mind. Uh, in a psychological sense of freedom. And I thought, well, this is obviously, at least at first glance, a very, very broad concept. So let's try to pitch it on the broadest level and see what we get, and then whether what we have has any conceptual defects uh, or uh, not. Now, the same parallel to revolution, except we're going to have something different. But if uh, we found that the broadest, most general concept of uh, freedom uh, was a valid concept, then we wouldn't have to give a specific political definition. We could say political freedom is just one example. And the freedom of an object falling uh, is another example, and that's all. Well, so I began to try to get a genus of this broad sense, and I said, well, it's obviously a characteristic or a state. So to that extent, I agree with number three. I'm starting, you see, now on the level of number three there a state, but I think you can be a little more specific than state. It's a state of action. Because if there were no action, if uh, those of you who know the philosopher Parmenides, if he was correct and everything was frozen absolutely motionless and couldn't move, the whole concept of freedom, even in its broadest sense, could not arise. And so you'd have to say freedom is a characteristic or state of action. So I think the genus offered here is, is too broad in number three, even for the broad level. And if we're taking it in the wide sense, I won't then, at least at this experimental stage, restrict myself to human action. Any action. Well, now that's my genus, a state of action. But what am I differentiating it from? Well, in a very broad sense, I'm trying to distinguish free action from action which is obstructed, or blocked, or restrained, or hindered, or hampered, or interfered with in some way. So I think to myself, freedom in this very broad sense designates a state of action that is open to be executed without barriers. There's nothing to stop it. So I formulate as a tentative definition an absence of impediments, barriers, or hindrances to action. Now it seems to me that this broad definition applies to the cases I started with. A free man, the government doesn't hinder or restrict it. Free will. There are no factors outside of your control governing you, obstructing you, forcing you to act a certain way. Free fall, there's nothing hindering the object's fall. There's no object pulling against it, nothing to obstruct its fall. A free mind, one that isn't clogged, weighed down by anxieties and conflicts, etc. Well, I think so far, so good. I'm on the track of some literal, very broad general concept. It's not equivocation, nor do I see that it's, any one of these is more primary than the other, and that the rest are simply metaphorical. There seems to be one literal common denominator. 
Now I always go, then I go through the step of checking it metaphysically. Checking it metaphysically. Remember we did that with revolution. Now let's do that with this concept defined in this way. And I say, yes, I can see an actual metaphysical basis for it. The basis is, there is such a phenomenon as action, and there's obviously one of two possibilities. The action can occur, or it can be stopped, or blocked, or hindered. And freedom designates the former of these two possibilities. So it seems to me there's a solid basis in reality for this very broad concept. And I so far make a good case for defining it in this broad way, and then if that were true, I would construe political freedom as simply one instance of it. Now I think you see that this broad approach provides a certain illumination. It ties together a whole bunch of different usages and it gives you a perspective on the concept. But I don't stop there because you have to ask yourself, when you have a concept this wide, have you introduced any problems by the fact of having this enormously broad a concept? Now sometimes You've gained and I haven't lost, and sometimes you've lost at the same time. Do I have a concept that is so wide that it is simply crying out for people to misuse it? And then I think to myself, well, there is in this definition, remember I'm working tentatively with the idea, the absence of hindrances or restrictions, etc., to action. There is in this definition no specification at all of what can constitute a hindrance or restriction or obstacle to action. And of course, since the definition is pitched so broadly, I couldn't possibly specify in the definition what would be a hindrance or an obstacle. Well, I think to myself, well, if I'm going to define a concept this enormously broadly, sure as can be, people are going to start applying it to things that they have no business at all applying it to, by means of a faulty or actively corrupt concept of what constitutes a hindrance. And pretty soon all sorts of things will start being called free or unfree on the basis of a thoroughly corrupt concept of what is a hindrance or an impediment. Now, for instance, I think right away, I've heard existentialists say, no man is free because we can't leap to the moon of our own uh, unaided uh, effort. The law of gravity hinders human freedom. Well, he is construing the law of gravity as a hindrance, an obstruction to action. Now, if I give no definition of hindrance, I open the idea up that it's permissible to say, yes, uh, man isn't free. Dostoevsky says in one of his works that two and two equals four is the enemy of freedom. And then so long as two and two equals four, man isn't free. Well, here again, the same idea. What's common to these uses of free is that they construe reality, some fact or condition or law of reality, as a hindrance or an obstruction. Now, this is obviously a serious corruption. Uh, reality is the frame of reference of all definitions, all concepts, and all actions. So anybody who construes reality, metaphysical reality now, as a, an impediment or an obstruction or a hindrance, is already out of this world in the literal sense. He is then construing freedom as requiring that you escape from reality. Now you see the trouble with the broad usage that I originally defined is that it leaves the door open for anybody to make up a use and application of free assuming a corrupt concept of hindrance or obstruction. There is no built-in safeguards against that kind of misuse. And now I think to myself, well, is this just existentialists? Or is there more examples of this very kind of misuse in English? And it's all over the place. It's positively riddled with corrupt uses of free on the basis of corrupt uses of or concepts of a hindrance. For instance, take free verse. Now, what is free verse? As is characteristically uh, defined, it's a verse without meter, rhyme, content, and in many cases, even without any sense. Just a wanton string of words. A verse devoid of any aesthetic features or principles. Now, what underlay the idea of calling this free verse? Well, obviously, the idea that adherence to aesthetic principles is a hindrance, an obstruction, 
an impediment to the individual's aesthetic creativity. Now there, of course, is an aesthetic issue, an issue of philosophy, but if your philosophy holds that aesthetic principles are guides to adhere to reality, then, of course, you will say, anybody who defines uh, adherence to objective aesthetic principle as a hindrance is philosophically corrupt, and therefore the co use of the term free verse is a philosophic corruption. But it's there, and it's cashing in on the undefined hindrance in our original statement. Then I think of free love. What is free love? The way people use it. Mindless promiscuity. What is the hindrance that they have in mind that free love is free of? Value standards. Well, there is an obvious, again, concept of a hindrance, which is mediated by a corrupt philosophy, and which therefore gives rise to a use of free, which I think is philosophically completely unjustified. Now take even the ordinary economic use, which is absolutely entrenched in the English language, and which would be used by people who wouldn't dream of approving of free verse or free, uh, uh, free love, namely free lunch. Now what is the implication of calling a free lunch free? The idea behind that is having to pay for the lunch would be a hindrance would be an obstruction, would be an interference with your action. Now, what is the deeper philosophic meaning? Since having to pay presupposes effort and productive uh, activity, the idea behind this is that effort, productive work, is a hindrance. And then free lunch, you see, is lunch which you get without any hindrance, without having to go through this. Now there is a truly corrupt philosophic view underlying this use of the term free. And it is the idea that the ideal of human life would be the Garden of Eden, in which you effortlessly sit back and the lunch falls in your mouth like manna from heaven. But if you have to work for it, well then of course you're not free. Now you wouldn't believe that a religious metaphysics underlies the idea of free for free lunch, but it does. And it is just as corrupt as free verse and uh, uh, free love. But it's absolutely entrenched in English. Now, we have to ask ourselves a question. We have to make a choice then. If we are going to safeguard the concept against these innumerable misuses, we have one of two possibilities. One is, we're going to keep the broad concept, but we are going to try to specify in the definition something to the effect that that concept of a hindrance must be construed in accordance with the facts of reality and morality. Now, I would say you can do that, that's okay, if you could do it. That is to say, if you can make yourself clear. But the first question anybody will ask you is, well, when is a hindrance in accordance with the facts of reality and morality, and when is it not? And to answer that question, what will you have to do? You'll have to start with metaphysics and work down to politics. You have to give him a whole system of philosophy before he will grasp what qualifies as a hindrance and what doesn't. And therefore, you will find that no matter what abstract formulation you try to give a hindrance to safeguard it, the chances are it will not stick, and you'll generate all these corrupt uses. Therefore, I make the decision, I'll take the second alternative instead of retaining that broad definition, even though I think there is that common denominator. I say, I think English made a mistake, that it was misleading to use one term in this way, and that what we should do is conceptualize specific types of unobstructed action, give each of them a separate concept, and thereby limit the possible corruption that you introduce by when you talk about the hindrance. So instead of talking of free will, I would say volition. Instead of a free good, a giveaway, etc. See what I mean? And get rid of that possibility of a corrupt use of hindrance. Now, English is slightly schizophrenic on this point because in the positive sense, it uses free in all these cases, but for the antonyms, it does have specific concepts defined. Like the antonym of free will uh, is determinism. The antonym of free man is slavery. The antonym of a free good is a costly uh, one, etc. So in that sense, English does already give us the guide by formulating specific concepts for the denial of, of each of these. 
Therefore, I say, when we come to politics, I would give a specifically political definition of freedom. Now, this is why, just before we get to that, why I would... You see now my objection to definition number three that was um, submitted, the state without restraints, because it opened too much misinterpretation. And I think the same is true, the state of being unconstrained by other humans. You specify it to some extent, but you see it still leaves wide open. What is a constraint? So I would, therefore, when I get to political freedom, try to pitch a specifically uh, political definition. And I would do the equivalent if I wanted to talk about psychological free freedom or uh, whatever it happens to be. So let us look at now, assuming we came to a political definition. Now, our broad analysis that we gave is still helpful. It gives us a general track. But here, if we're going to try to pitch a particular political definition, then obviously it's going to pertain to human action, not simply action in general. And if it's political action, then the candidate to be the obstructor, the hinderer of the action is clearly the government. But I say to myself, can you say any government action deprives a man of his political freedom? And now this is an issue of your philosophy. But I would answer no. If a gangster is arrested, the arrest does not violate his freedom, not his political freedom, because according to the philosophy I subscribe to, freedom does not encompass the right to commit crimes. So what kind of government action then, what I say, is legitimately to be described as a hindrance to action in a political context? What I'd say is when the government initiates coercion against innocent men, people who have done nothing to harm others, that his freedom is gone. So I reach, therefore, as a working political definition, freedom, the political condition in which an individual is not subject to the initiation of governmental coercion. Now I've specified what is the hindrance, and I stress the word there, the initiation. In other words, is not subject to the government starting it against him when he uh, um, has not himself started it. But retaliation, I permit. And by this means, I don't, uh, I make it specific enough so it cannot be corrupted. Now, another point in regard to definitions is you have to ask yourself, are you prepared to accept their implications. Now, if you define freedom as I just did, someone will say to me, well, then aren't you free under anarchy? Because under anarchy, there is no government, and therefore there's no government to initiate coercion against you. And I would say, yes, I'm prepared to accept that under anarchy, you are free, so long as it lasts. But my objection to anarchy would not be the government under anarchy enslaves you, but that it will immediately degenerate into gang warfare and end up in tyranny. And therefore, uh, I'd say, okay, if, that, if my implication is under pure anarchy there is freedom, I'll accept that. Then I think to myself, but my definition would mean, suppose a fellow citizen takes you into his home and locks you up in a dungeon. By your definition, since it's not the government that did it, he did it in his private capacity as a private citizen, his freedom hasn't been interfered with. Are you prepared to accept that as a concept? And I would say to myself, yes. If we're talking about political freedom, then he has not been deprived of his political freedom, supposing, let us say, he lives in a free country, then the right is still on his side, and presumably he can appeal to the government to release him and arrest uh, the criminal. He's still politically free, even though he is not physically free at that moment. Now, there may be contexts where you want to distinguish this type of situation. And I've, for instance, seen people use freedom in this sense, as the general term for uh, the absence of coercion on the part of other human beings, whether governmental or private, and then use the term liberty for specifically the political usage, you see, absence of coercion specifically on the part of the government. And you can make that distinction if in some context you find it of value. But I think the central element in freedom is that the person is not subject to the initiation of force or coercion on the part of the government. That is the essence of the concept I would reach. Now that leaves me with just one to criticize number one. Now I have two objections to number one, as it was offered. To first of all, I think it's much too narrow. 
by equating freedom simply with the production and owning the fruits of one's own labor, you would uh, tolerate an enormous degree of government coercion by this definition as long as it didn't touch your property. In other words, the government, for instance, left you during the day free to go and produce in the fields, let's say, by your own labor, and it didn't take anything away. It's just that at night it strapped you into the bed, put uh, you know, a telescreen and pump propaganda uh, into you uh, all night long and 10,000 other things, which are not interference with your property rights, but certainly interference with your freedom. So uh, unless you construe, produce and own the fruits of your labor so broadly as to encompass all actions that you take, in which case this is a very misleading formulation, this is too narrow. The other thing I would object to is using the concept of individual right in the definition of freedom. Now, certainly freedom is one of man's rights. It is an individual right. But if you put that in the definition, you are going to uh, open yourself up to a real circularity because you are going to say freedom is an individual right, and then you are going to say, well, what is a right? Man's rights are the right to life, liberty, etc., and you're going to have freedom in terms of right and right in terms of freedom when you go on to define right. And therefore, I think philosophically it is better to define freedom simply as what does the condition consist of without yet passing a moral evaluation. Is man entitled to it or not? Is it good or not? And then when you get on to political philosophy, you know what it consists of. It's the same issue as why I wouldn't call independence a virtue in its definition, the point we discussed earlier. Okay, uh, if it's brief, yes. Yes, this is, you say, is this a negative definition? Yes, freedom is essentially, I think, in this respect, a negative concept. It's when you are, you know, let's say fair is leave me alone. Don't do something to me. And in that sense, you are free from something. You are free to act only because you are left alone by others, specifically the government, and therefore you're free to act. But there is an essential negative element. It's when you are not interfered with, obstructed, hindered, have coercion uh, initiated upon you, etc. And in that sense, uh, uh, free is often used as a negation, as you'll see. In English, for instance, we say certain is free from doubt, as an example there of that. But let's leave that. Let us jump on now to, what do we have left? Sandwich and propaganda. Oh, let's do sandwich next. Now, sandwich is which number? 22. Is that not truly? Bread surrounding another ingredient? Bread surrounding another ingredient. Right. Well, like for instance, if you bake bread around a piano, <laughs> Or you put a thumbtack between bread or fill it with hydrochloric acid. Obviously, the kindest, most charitable thing you could say about this definition of sandwich is that it is too broad. <laughs> now, let us whip off sandwich. I put that in just to give you something physical so it wouldn't be all very abstract things like freedom and revolution and so on. And physical entities are much, much easier uh, to define, but I put one in just as an example. Now, who has a definition of sandwich to offer? Well, somebody that hasn't uh, volunteered up to now? Yes. Sandwiches. Some food, some food between, well, it can't be between one piece. Oh, on each side, I see. <laughs> Some food between one or more pieces of bread on either side, was it? On either side. Pieces implying any form of bread? Well, let's restrict ourselves to just pieces of bread. Okay. So if we have any food, some food, unrestricted, that is between pieces of bread. There could be one piece on one side and one on the other, or two pieces and one, or two and two, 
etc. You're not restricting the quantity of pieces. Right? You obviously have in mind club sandwiches, right, which you want to right, uh, uh, get into. Uh, now, I don't want to take the time to go into this, all sorts of definitions that are possible. Uh, but we have to make a basic decision here. There are, I, I think there are some virtues and some weaknesses in this definition, but let's just jump right onto this definition. You have to make a decision. You decided you're going to include club sandwiches or double-decker sandwiches, and therefore you can't confine yourself to two pieces of bread. Now, you could look at it that way. There's nothing wrong with it. But the word sandwich has a whole proliferation of uses. All of them developments from two slices of bread, which is the root uh, concept. If you're going to start encompassing all uh, subcategories and variations, there's no good grounds to include simply club sandwiches, because what about open sandwiches, where it isn't between two pieces of bread, it used to be, but they separated them. And then once you're going to start that, what about ice cream sandwiches? See where they've got uh, between crackers or cookies, etc. And then once you're going to start that, by de derivation from that, the person can say he was in the subway during the rush hour and he was sandwiched between two huge men. You see, now that obviously becomes metaphorical uh, at that point. But there are many metaphorical extensions and many variations on the basic unit. But I think to get at the root concept in a case like this is the primary task of a definition, recognizing that there are variations of club sandwiches and open sandwiches, etc., but that they simply are uh, variations. So I would take as my task a plain ordinary garden variety sandwich uh, that you're defining and therefore I would not uh, feel any qualms at all about saying two slices of bread. Uh, you'd be amazed in a class how bitter the discussion of this point <laughs> can become and the class divides into the two slices versus the many slices. But I don't think there's a great deal of point in that. Now, uh, you told us in your definition uh, what a sandwich was, in essence, but you didn't give us a genus. Now, the best genus I have heard of uh, for a sandwich, my first thought in thinking about this was type of food. I couldn't think what else you could call a sandwich. And then somebody told me once, I think it was a student, that it's better to give it as a genus a food preparation. And I said, what's the difference between a food preparation and type of food? And this woman said, uh, well, a food is the broader term. You know, potatoes are food, and cows, in a certain sense, are food potentially, and so on. But a food preparation is a combination of ingredients put together by a human being. And therefore, it gives it a little more specificity as a genus. So I was converted right off the bat by that. <laughs> so I now hold out for food preparation as the genus. And now, what are we going to have as a differentia? Essentially, what this gentleman said, I think, with certain variations, two slices of bread. Now, you say with some food between them. Well, I think there are at least two things you can exclude from the filling. One, as far as I know, is bread. <laughs> I never heard of a bread sandwich, and I can't imagine why anyone would want to eat it. So I think you'd have to say that the Filling excludes bread. And uh, the other thing is, I believe it must exclude liquid foods, like a milk sandwich, you know, or an orange juice sandwich, etc. So I would incline to say a food preparation consisting of two slices of bread with a layer of solid food other than bread between them. That is what I ended up with. Now, you see that, I don't think you gain a great deal from that, but that's an idea if you're working. You see how much infinitely easier that is than concepts like revolution uh, and so on. All right, let us turn to propaganda. And that is number, what? 20, is it? And how does it read it? Um, any attempt to persuade other people to accept your ideas. Any attempt to persuade other people to accept your ideas. Well, without making any comments on this definition as it's given in number 20, who wants to volunteer a definition of propaganda? We have a volunteer. Somebody that hasn't volunteered up to now? <laughs> <laughs> 
if you want and if I can see a hand. Otherwise, it's wide open to anybody who wants it. All right, right at the front. Uh, the public's dissemination of ideas for the purpose of furthering or handling a cause, institution, or person. All right. The public dissemination... No, I don't have a photographic memory. Say it again. Of ideas. For the purpose of... For the purpose of... Furthering or handling. Furthering or hampering. Hampering a cause, institution, or person. Well, all right. The public dissemination, you suggest, of ideas for the purpose of furthering or hampering a cause, institution, or person. Well, could we just linguistically simplify it a bit? Would you object? If we took out hampering and understood that the cause could be defined negatively, so that you're, you're out to, uh, to ha harm somebody is your cause. And that'll make it a little easier. So can I cross out hampering? And can I cross out institution or person with the understanding they were including cause in such a way that it could be a particular person who was a cause, celeb, or an institution, or a whole uh, philosophy? So we could just say for the purpose of furthering a cause, right? So the essence of it, I mean, since we're not actually trying to write a literary definition, but just to get the essence is it's the public dissemination of ideas for the purpose of furthering a cause is propaganda, right? Now that is a clear concept. Whether that's a valid definition is a different question. Who has a significantly different uh, um, uh, definition of propaganda? Does anybody? But significantly different. I mean, as again, simply the dissemination of thoughts among people to achieve a goal, which would be the same thing, only you'd use all different words. You have a different, significantly. Okay, sure. Ah, okay. All right. The purpose, well, for ideological ends includes that as purposeful, so we can leave that out. So say it again, it's the use of, of false information and or fallacious argument. Yes? In public. Yeah. Uh, in public for ideological ends. All right, in public, the, the use of false information and or fallacious argument for public ideological purposes, right? For the dissemination of uh, ideas uh, publicly. So you both have the concept of public dissemination. You both have that it's ideological, that it's of ideas. You both have that as purposeful for the purpose of some end or cause. So the essential difference between them is that uh, the first definition holds that any public dissemination of ideas, whether they're true or false, validly argued for or invalidly, is propaganda. And you say, no, we must restrict the concept to specifically false or fallacious methods of disseminating ideas for public purposes. Right? Yeah. Deliberate. Deliberate use. Well, that doesn't uh, change too much. It's simply, you, in other words, you want to suggest that he knows what he's doing, that he's, uh, he's an evil person, as again, simply a mistaken person who uses, commits a fallacy. Uh, but the s central distinction is still between you. When she, the first uh, definer, defines propaganda, there's no commitment at all to there being anything negative or bad about the person. As far as that definition is concerned, he could be a saint. His cause could be the most magnificently noble thing in the world. And on the other hand, your definition restricts it unequ unequivocally to somebody who is no good uh, and takes a lot of public dissemination of ideas uh, um, out of the realm of propaganda. Now, those are the two basic uh, uh, things that will give us enough to fight over which is an appropriate definition of uh, propaganda. Now, there is a certain type of person who defines propaganda as any speech. But if you define propaganda as any speech, it's a completely vacuous and superfluous concept, then, because you already have a concept to name that, namely what? Speech. And to define one concept as nothing but a synonym of another is to make it vacuous. Now, let me tell you what I went through. Uh, in uh, defining propaganda, and then come back to these two. And uh, I definitely incline to one of these as against the other. <laughs>
And the whole trick now is this raises a different category of problem. Now let me put a disclaimer at the outset. I have very serious doubts as to whether this concept of propaganda, however defined, is a legitimate concept. If uh, speakers of English had come to me, and it's obvious they couldn't have, in advance, and had said, we have this concept already to let loose, should we? If it had been up to me, I would have a very strong tendency to say, no, don't do it. But since it is here, I am tentatively going to explore it from the point of view of what would it mean if I accepted it? And what kind of reservations do I have about it? And then decide at the end, will I continue to use it? only make my context perfectly clear, or will I say, oh, this is anathema and I won't use it. But let's give it the benefit of the doubt at the outset. But this is simply to point out to you in advance, the fact that a word is around and is widely used does not mean it is incumbent upon you to find some valid definition if there is an inherent corruption in the very concept, if there is. Now, the word propaganda is sometimes used in the verb sense of he is propagandizing and sometimes the content of the propaganda, the ideas. So it doesn't make any difference which one we focus on, but I took the, idea, the content sense, so let's start there. And I said that propaganda, the others took the dissemination, which is simply the activity of propagandizing, but I took the content disseminated. So I started with my genus, a body of ideas. And of course, so is philosophy, religion, medicine, the science of medicine, etc. Well, what is the uh, distinction? Then what is, differentiates propaganda from uh, all the other kinds of bodies of ideas there? Are? Well, here you get a big clue from the etymology, if you want it. it obviously, is the gerund of propagate, to, from the word, verb to propagate, to spread something. And so uh, it was pretty easy knowing the genus, that the differentia is, this is my first thought, something which is deliberately, actively, methodically spread for some purpose, to further some cause. Now, dissemination is the same idea. So, so far I'm at the level you were, the public dissemination of ideas for the purpose of furthering some cause. But I would stress the idea of the act of spreading for it to be uh, propaganda. That is how I would say, assuming we accept this concept at all, that you would distinguish propaganda from education, teaching, persuasion, argumentation, communication. Uh, in all those cases, you might be communicating ideas, but you're not necessarily actively working to spread, to propagate, to hammer the ideas home. Now, for instance, suppose I come into a class now, I simply, it's an ordinary class, and I say two and two equals four. And even if I want to convince the people in the class that two and two equals four, that is not propaganda. But suppose my class has several existentialists in it, and I know those existentialists hate two and two equals four. They regard that as their enemy. And I take every occasion I can to rub in, you know, another shot for two and two equals four, so that I'm really out to push it, see. Then an existentialist in that situation could say the whole class is propaganda for two and two equals four. Or again, if in a normal geography class I say the earth is flat, uh, is round, excuse me, uh, that's not propaganda. But if I deliver a speech to the Flat Earth Society, and I'm out to push that idea, you see, then from their point of view, they could legitimately say he's a flat, a round earth propagandist. So propaganda implies a stressed campaign where you actively work to spread something. And as long as you understand that by dissemination, uh, um, uh, you catch, I think, an essential. Now I had one quick thought. What about a lawyer in court who is actively working to sell the jury on the innocence of his client? Is that propaganda? And I decided that was not propaganda because he had a very definite, delimited purpose. He wanted to convince these 12 men as an end in itself. And I think what makes it propaganda is the idea of widespread public dissemination as against in some very limited practical situation. 
So I ended up, if we interpret it this way so far, essentially with definition one, with a little more emphasis on the idea of spreading. But then I thought, the term propaganda obviously has a pejorative connotation. It sounds bad uh, the way people use it. Now, the first question you must ask when you hear that is, why? Now, there are theoretically two possible reasons why a concept could have a condemnation built right into it. One is because the thing that it is describing is inherently corrupt. And therefore, the concept rationally has built in a negative assessment. The other is that the concept names something which, by its definition, is perfectly innocent, but corrupt philosophic views on the part of the people who use it automatically equate that concept with something negative and bad. Now, if it ever is the second case, then I cannot countenance that kind of usage. If it is a corrupt philosophy that is giving it a negative connotation, then I absolutely reject that negative connotation in anything that feeds it. Now I ask myself, if all I have so far is the idea a propagandist is somebody who works hard to spread certain ideas, to spread a certain ideology publicly. He really wants to put it over. Now why in the word, in the world, should there be inherent in that concept a negative estimate. Why? What is negative about that? And I think there is one obvious philosophic tenet held by people which would make that negative, although the activity as defined is as innocent and as wholesome as an activity can be. If, however, you hold the view that nobody can know the truth, that there are no absolutes, nobody can be sure of anything, you will then immediately conclude that anybody who works actively to spread certain ideas and is out to push them must be what? He must be irrational, a fanatic, a dogmatist, etc. And that kind of person would say, on the other hand, that if you were rational, what would you do? Well, you'd know all your ideas are tentative, that your opinion is no better than anybody else's. You wouldn't dream of trying to spread and push your ideas. You'd, in effect, keep your mouth shut and get drunk the way he does. Now, I say it's some kind of skepticism philosophically, which leads to that automatic equation of propaga propagating an idea with corrupt methods of doing it. And I say I see nothing inherent in the idea of propagating an idea. Uh, that is negative in that way. And consequently, since I deny the epistemology, which I believe underlies that, I refuse to endorse the negative connotation. So, on that grounds, I would be quite content and happy to say, as I define it, I am an objectivist propagandist. I go out of my way to spread and push objectivist ideas publicly for the sake of remaking the country according to the way objectivism holds it should be. And I wouldn't have any qualms about describing myself as that. But <clears throat> I say, well, let's consider the question a little further before I so uh, immediately say I'm going to grab a hold of this concept in this form. Would it be valid? Leave aside now the question of the corrupt philosophy that might underlie it. Should we have a specific concept, not simply to designate ideas that people spread, but ideas that people spread irrationally? Would there be a point in having a specific concept to designate that, as against simply to spread ideas? Now, in that case, if we had a concept where we included the idea, you see, of, that is deliberately false or deliberately fallacious, as the second definition suggests. <laughs> or putting it broadly, that it's an irrational, deliberate spreader uh, of ideas, then I would say I would not call myself a propagandist. Uh, um, in which case, then, we would include in the very concept distortions, misrepresentations, emotional appeals, all of the falsehoods and fallacies, etc. Now, how would you decide a question like this? If you were doing it from scratch, is it of value or not? Do you gain or lose more? if you include this type of uh, negative assessment, the irrational element, 
in the concept of propaganda, do you gain or lose? Well, here there is the following point to consider. And this again has broader significance, and that's why I chose this example. When you define a concept, other things being equal, the application of the concept must be easily automatizable. It must be comparatively easy to automatize, to make use of, to do something. Now I say other things being equal. If it's a technical concept from one of the sciences, then of course you cannot give a lay definition that will be simple to use. But if we're talking about concepts for general use, it must be easy to use them, other things being equal. And that's in the very nature of a concept. The purpose of a concept is to integrate concretes, to put them together into easily dealable with units. Now, the more judgment, the more thought, the more distinctions and analysis that you have to go through before you can apply a concept, the more complex it is to employ that concept, the harder it is to make automatic and to be able to use and therefore the less valuable the concept. And consequently, I would say other things being equal, if everything else is equal, define in such a way as to promote easy automatizing of the concept and thereby easy use of it. Now, by this criterion, if we put in the concept of propaganda that it must consist of irrational methods, there are so many possibilities that it does not become, comparatively speaking, an easy concept to apply. Now, it's still possible. Obviously, it's still possible to apply in that usage, but it is not nearly as easy to define, uh, recognize instances of it. Because if the question becomes, is this propaganda in a particular case? Before you can answer it, what would you have to do? You'd have to analyze, well, is what he said true? Or is it false? And if it's false, is it deliberately false? Or is it just an error of knowledge? And it does it contain fallacies? What are his arguments? And did he know that those were fallacies or not? Now, by the time you have to know that much before you can qualify something as propaganda, you can see that already it would become enormously controversial to call something propaganda. Because you'd already be assessing its truth, the validity of its reasoning, and the knowledge of the person who put it forth you would generate enormous and utterly useless controversies. Because in that case, the, if you've gone through all that work, presumably the question on your mind is, are the ideas true? That's what counts. Who cares that somebody's going around spreading them? That becomes a triviality after you've done that much work. Now, to have to do all that work in order to apply a term like propaganda, I think makes it a concept that is uh, beside, uh, simply beside the point. From this point of view, for the two reasons I mentioned. One, the first, that I think it's philosophically unjustified. And second, uh, the point uh, I just made, that it enormously hampers the ease of its use. I would object to including in propaganda the idea that it's deliberately false information or fallacious argument or that it is uh, irrational at all. But, just to conclude this point, would I then go on the barricades to fight for the definition of propaganda as in that first more general sense of uh, the act of spreading of ideas which makes no reference to the myth? No, I would not. And here the key point is, not every concept that we have is necessarily valid, justifiable, or useful. This is obvious in the case of overtly mystical concepts like God and so on. But there are many concepts which we have, which other languages don't have, and it is not necessary in every such case that there be such a concept. The question you have to ask is essentially two about a candidate for a concept. One, does it name something crucial that you cannot dispense with? Now this concept is easy to dispense with. If you ever want to say somebody is actively spreading ideas, say it. Say it that way, which is very simple. There's no need to have a special concept uh, to cover that. You can communicate it perfectly simply without it. Now, on the other hand, contrast this with the concept selfish. Now, there is a concept which has a definition and a negative connotation on philosophic grounds. Now, there I would say you have to fight that connotation and save that concept because it names something indispensable. 
something without which you could not make a valid ethical position, and therefore you have to fight. But in the case of propaganda, what is the point of the fight? Why go through it all? You've got nothing that you have to name so urgently anyway. And then my second criterion in this connection would be, is it a concept that is easily leads to abuses? And I think propaganda is one that does easily lead to abuses, because what it does is put over in people's mind, because of that connotation, the package deal uh, that anybody who fights to spread ideas is thereby uh, irrational. Uh, so I would say, to summarize this point at the end, I think the concept propaganda as it stands today is more harmful than uh, helpful, but I don't think you could make an airtight case that it must be abandoned, and consequently I would say if you go on to uh, define it, define it in the more general way for the reasons that uh, uh, I mentioned. But the point I wanted to indicate by using propaganda as an example is do not assume that every concept that is around, even if it's not overtly mystical, is necessarily valid and that you must be, uh, go ahead and give a definition of it. Take into account what does it name, what's its relation to reality, is there an objective need for it, what are the kinds of concretes it would integrate, what abuses might it lead to, etc. And then you see you have a solid basis to frame a definition. Now, I hope that by discussing these five examples, you get an idea that there are a terrific number of types of problems that come up when you do definitions that are not all taken care of simply by Aristotle's rules, crucial as they are. And you see there's a whole field here, and every time you plunge into a new type of concept, there's a whole bunch of further types of questions. All I can say is that I tried to give you this evening some leads to the kinds or some kinds of questions that will come up in your defining. And from here, I think each person, in the lack of anything written, should, uh, should try and develop as he can on his own, whatever further rules or developments uh, you can. And I hope uh, someday to uh, write a book on this specific subject, formulating general rules of the application of the theory of concepts to the process of definition. I think you see it's a very interesting, uh, fascinating subject to map it all out. And all I could give you tonight is some leads, but at least we did that much. Now we do have about five minutes, so if you let me, let us kill off some of these that we have left in the remaining five minutes, and then that gives us a very large assignment for next week because we have to do induction. Certain of the exercises on induction, otherwise we'll run out in the tenth week, and all of the definitions that we don't get finished tonight. So I'm going to rattle off a few. Now, now these are easier because we're not required to state what the definition would be. Well, let's see. We got up to number nine. Is that correct? All right, fine. Uh, number nine, a piece of sculpture. Yeah, there I tried to give the definition that the modern uh, non-objectivist artist would give. A man-made object in a gallery or a museum, which has three dimensions, reviews in the press, and no practical purpose. Uh, the transcript just about it the way many of the moderns use it. Now, just to plunge in and say a few obvious things about this, the genus is much too wide. The genus is, at minimum, art, fine art. Uh, not simply man-made object. The essence of sculpture in this respect is that it's a type of art, and genus would connect, uh, if you use that genus, it would connect it to everything else we know about art. And you could even make as your genus visual art to distinguish it uh, from literature and include painting and so on. Uh, now, that it has to be in a gallery or museum is obviously irrelevant and too narrow. The moderns put that in because they have no, they count anything as sculpture if they find it in a gallery or museum. So for them, that's the essence. Uh, that it has three dimensions is certainly true, but as formulated, that is not too well put because everything physical has three dimensions, including a painting, a book, etc. Now you see here, if you had art in your genus, the three dimensions would take a different meaning. It's art, 
which recreates reality in three-dimensional form as against painting, which does it by two dimensions, etc. But if you simply say it has three dimensions, well, what doesn't if it's a physical object? And, of course, that it has no practical purpose is an inept way of trying to say that it comes under art, and therefore that is negative. That it has press reviews is obviously too wide and too narrow. It's not true of all sculpture, it's not true only of sculpture, and it's completely non-fundamental. Uh, As for a direction for this concept, I would say it would have to be visual art, and the differential would have to include the issue of three-dimensionality appropriately formulated uh, to distinguish it from paint. Now, number 10 I put in from the Random House Dictionary. A sacrifice is the surrender or destruction of something of value for the sake of greater gain. I put that in for two reasons. One, to show you that a dictionary is not per se a Bible that can be taken as a self-evident authority. And the second, to give you an example of a definition about which the best thing to say is, it is wrong, simply false. It would not be appropriate to say about this definition it's too narrow or too wide, because to say it's too narrow would imply it's true of some sacrifices but not of all. And to say it's too wide is to say it's true of sacrifice and other things, and neither of those are applicable in this case. This is the same kind of definition as if I say a cigarette is a pig with wings. That's not too narrow and it's not too wide, it's simply wrong. So. Uh, uh, what is wrong about this definition? Well, the genus is essentially all right. It's the surrender and of a, a destruction of a value. But now, the thing that destroys this definition is the differential, for the sake of greater gain. Whereas, obviously, what is the, uh, it that makes something a sacrifice? If you give somebody, to use Ms. Rand's example, a penny and he gives you a dollar, you have fulfilled this definition perfectly. You surrendered something of value for the sake of greater gain. That is not a sacrifice. But if you do it in reverse, other things being equal, it is. So it's obvious that essential to the differentia is that it's the surrender of a higher value to one that you regard as of lower value or of non-value uh, uh, in, in your estimate of it. Now, the source of this random house dictionary is from the medieval approach according to which when you sacrificed, you always did it for God, and the greater gain was going to be your entry into heaven. But you see, that is invalid, because in the respect that the medievals promised you entry into heaven, they were to that extent appealing to something selfish in human beings, even if an otherworldly form of selfishness. That was not pure sacrifice that they demanded. But today, in the post-Kantian era, we have really an ethics of sacrifice, not the old-fashioned medieval trade-off of this world for the next, but real complete sacrifice, which is giving up without getting or with actively losing uh, in the process. In other words, actively reversing your hierarchy of values and selling out the best for the lowest. That's what Kant and his disciples actively perpetrated, and that's what you'd have to cover under uh, a definition of sacrifice. Now, let us see. We have a lot, about a few minutes. Oh, fine. Let's try and do a few more if we can. I understand if you have to leave, but let's try and do just a couple more because these we can do more briefly. Number 11, the spiritual element in man means the part which is non-material. This is obviously negative. It doesn't tell you what it is, but simply what it isn't. As to a direction for a definition of spiritual, obviously that depends on your philosophy, but within an objectivist framework, the element in man that is there being referred to is his consciousness. That's all objectivism recognizes as spiritual, and therefore spiritual we would take as meaning pertaining to man's consciousness. If anybody asks for a definition of consciousness, ultimately I would say that is ostensive. That's one of those philosophic primaries that you have to point to. The importance of defining this issue positively rather than negatively, if you define it negatively, you simply open the door to all the materialists and behaviorists who say, well, this is something mystical, and therefore there is no consciousness. Now, 12, that's Plato's famous definition of time, the moving image of eternity. And I put that in just to give you an example of a definition which is obscure by reason of being metaphorical. And our image there is, uh, in Plato's system, 
in a certain way he means it literally because he believed in two different worlds. And the one world, the higher world, was eternal, was out of time. And this world, there was a certain motion took place, which was the image in this world corresponding to eternity in the other. So it was a vague metaphorical attempt to define time within the framework of his philosophy, but it obviously is out on obscurity grounds. For a positive definition of time, I refer you to Aristotle, who defines it in terms of a certain kind of relationship, a measurement of motion. And let us sneak in anger and stop there, and that won't give us too many for next week. A wrathful, irate, emotional state often expressed in rage. This is a circular definition three times over. <laughs> wrathful means angry. I, in fact, I constructed this definition by looking up soon. <laughs> irate means angry, and rage is a state of intense anger. And consequently, uh, this definition is Anger is an angry, angry state often expressed as severe anger, <laughs> which is a completely hopeless uh, uh, definition. As to a positive direction, you would have to, if you were doing this carefully, map out, as we did with revolution, the distinction between anger, indignation, rage, fury, and there are appropriate distinctions between them, but as a generalized direction, I think you'd have to say it's a strong or violent negative feeling. And then it's aroused by or consisting of a condemnation of something you judge as wrong. Uh, that's the essence uh, of it. Fascism we did. And I'll leave, uh, we have sleep, cause, Republican, logic, John Dewey. Oh, we have garbage. A few things left, but we can do those <laughs> next week. Thank you very much and good night.